This is the Jocko Podcast number 397 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. The President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Legion of Merit to Captain Matthew T. Preventure, Medical Corps, United States Navy, for exceptionally meritorious conduct in the performance of outstanding service as the Command Medical Officer at 4 Sea, Air, and Land SEAL Team 17 from June 2013 to June 2022. Captain Preventure displayed extraordinary leadership, world-class professional expertise, and provided unmatched care and treatment for the service members within his command and throughout the Naval Special Warfare community. He was instrumental in in the implementation of policy, processes, and procedures that optimized the operational readiness of both reserve and active force SEAL operators. A world-renowned orthopedic surgeon and educator, he delivered databases to track treatment efficacy, wearable devices that provided remote assessment of individual motion patterns, and leading-edge science that will improve human performance and longevity. His contributions extend far beyond the Naval Special Warfare medical community to programs and cutting-edge science treatments that have been adopted by the Navy and Department of Defense. Captain Preventures, Superior performance of duties culminated in his 27 years of honorable and dedicated military service. By his dynamic direction, keen judgment, and loyal dedication to duty, Captain Preventure reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. And that is an award. That's actually an understatement. It's an understatement for someone that had a huge impact on the SEAL teams, putting broken SEALs back together. I had one of my friends tell me about Doc, and he said, he repaired both my left and right shoulders. My left one after a vehicle rollover in Iraq 2008. He's been a huge reason I've been able to keep pushing my body so hard. Him and others like him are the unsung heroes of the SEAL teams helping hurt and damaged guys come back and operate again. I and so many other SEALs appreciate him with the greatest sincerity. And that is the truth. Guys in the SEAL teams get broken. It's a rough job. It is a rough job. And guys like Doc Preventure put us back together again. And on top of that, this group that he headed up spearheaded injury prevention, optimal human performance, including strength and conditioning, nutrition, brain health, mental wellness, and they do this with experience, knowledge, and patriotic passion, and and an unmitigated commitment to the SEAL teams. Well, after being the lead medical officer for the SEAL teams for almost a decade, and then working at Mass General in Boston, and being the head team physician and medical doctor for the New England Patriots, Doc Preventure certainly has some incredible knowledge on all these different topics, and it's an honor to have him here tonight to pass on his experiences and lessons learned from this vast experience. Doc, thanks for joining us. Jocko, Echo Charles, it's a great pleasure. Thank you. Truly honored to be here tonight. So we we have to recap something here because once again, you are another witness. And I believe the first time I remember interacting with you was to check uh, my bicep, which had been injured. I was doing jujitsu and my my bicep had popped, made a noise, and I came in to the... What do we call it? The Human Performance Center? What was it called? Yeah, medical. The human medical. Performance, yeah. I go into the medical, <laughs> right? And I I go in there, and I see Jason, who's who who helped me with some little tweaks here and there, to look at my bicep. You did an assessment of my bicep. What was your assessment assessment of my bicep? Jacko, I, and what I recall was you, you were in some kind of hold, and uh, you know you felt this pop, pretty classic at the elbow. It's almost always a rupture of the biceps tendon where it attaches into your forearm. And it's pretty important for someone like you and what you want to do, be able to move the forearm right and also biceps hold. And and looked at 
torn your biceps. Mm -hmm. And in general, for someone like you, that's something we take to surgery to fix because you need to have that right. So you, you said to me, hey, look, Jocko, here's the situation. You got a torn bicep and this won't heal. This is, you need to get surgery. And you scheduled the surgery right there. You had the little computer system. You scheduled the surgery and it was maybe three, four weeks away. And you said, okay, in whatever, this date, come back in here for your pre-operation check. I said, Roger that. You know, I'm one of those people, if I got a problem and you tell me how I'm gonna fix it, I'm, I'm ready to go. Like, I'm not gonna wait around, let's do it. So I come back three weeks later for my pre-op- pre-operation tests, checkup, and you're there, and you look at my bicep and what had happened. I couldn't believe it, but <laughs> it had actually healed. I mean, you had no strength deficits. You had complete restoration of function. I, I, I don't know what happened. I mean, you knew something was wrong a couple weeks prior, and it's kind of the first time we could get you in for surgery, and we had to get you in in a couple weeks before this tendon got, the muscle got too atrophied, and it was harder to repair, but... I said, what the heck is going on here? <laughs> this thing is, I've done, I'm testing and I'm like, Jason Jack, she's there and I'm like, Jason, what's going on? He's like, I don't know, it's healed. He's got full strength. <laughs> He's ready to go back in the fight. So there you go, Echo Charles. So okay. Echo has, he, he told me when I first explained this, cause he's had both biceps torn, mm. both bicep tendons torn. He's had surgery on both arms and I told him, after his first one or maybe after his second one, I said, you know, when I, that happened to me, I just healed it. <laughs> <laughs> and he did not believe me. Mm-hmm. He did not believe nope, me. It wasn't until we had Doc Parsley on here and confirmed. And now yeah. we've got the second witness. Yeah. yeah. Echo, but do you accept now that Wolverine not. blood is a real thing? So when Doc Parsley <laughs> came on, I was like, he was like saying it. I was like, there's something you guys are missing here. I know that already. But I was 50% convinced. <laughs> so I was like, okay, maybe, you know, he is a doctor after all. So whatever. And then, yes. Yes, sir. I believe it now. Yeah. That's the other fifty percent right now has been confirmed. Yeah. So I think, yeah, and, and I think I remember talking to Parsley about that as well. And I was like, "What? What's going on with the uh, the, the system here? This is almost always something we fix. There's no uh, tendon there. It's like the one of the easier diagnoses we make." <laughs> I've I feel like I'm pretty lucky. I've been, you know, actually, Echo, you described to me one time as being durable. Yeah. And I would say I'm not I'm definitely not the strongest person. I'm not the fastest person. I'm not the smartest person, but my durable my durability level seems to be good. Very, we're very we're good. appreciative of that. Yeah. So, uh Doc, seriously, um all the guys know what you've done in the SEAL teams and how many people you've helped. And it's not just the SEAL teams because you were working on everybody in the military and we'll get into that. But let's start off with the beginning. Let's start off about wh- how you became who you are. Let's go. Where'd you start? Born in New Hampshire, is that right? Yeah, we're in a really small town, Jocko, in New Hampshire. We maybe 2,500 people, a place where the, the general store is the post office. Mm-hmm. Didn't have a traffic light. We didn't have cable TV. We had a channel or two maybe on the television with the antenna that you had to. My dad and I had to get up there and fix all the time. And you had a little dial that mm-hmm. could point the antenna oh, yeah. to get the better yep. signal on this motor. When we got that motor. It was great. We didn't have to go out and rotate it manually. Yep. And then the ice and the snow and everything would jack it all up. So we, we grew up in the woods mm-hmm. and we were close enough to the beach that we took care of advantage of, uh, took advantage of everything out in New England and New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. It was a great place to grow up as a kid. Love what, being outside. What'd your dad do? My dad, so my dad was a Naval Academy grad. Oh, okay. Uh, he was in the Navy for a while. Uh, I was born in Newport, Rhode Island, actually. And then we moved up to New Hampshire and he was... Uh, by trade, an engineer for a number of different companies. Was he a surface warfare officer in the Navy? He was. Okay. And you know what's interesting, Jocko? He had USMC inscribed in his Naval Academy ring, mm. but at the last minute switched. Interesting. What year was that? That was 1969. He graduated. S- what made him make that decision? I don't know. I mean, I think it was different times then. I, mean, I think no. you have to remember Vietnam War. No, I was going to say it's 1969. Yeah, exactly. You're so going to Nam. I, I think there were some changes there and you know mindset and you know i was at when i was at the naval academy with some many of your great colleagues in the, in the seal teams we I, it was a great place to be and i know it was very good when he was there but the the political climate made it sometimes a challenge to be at a place like annapolis so how long did he do in the navy so he did he did just over five years and got out of newport rhode island and we moved up to, and they moved up to new hampshire and 
and uh, after I was born. And, and my brother also uh, was born a few years after me. He's three years younger, and he also went to the Naval Academy, and he got the much better genetics, as I say, because <laughs> – He's the uh, he's the F eighteen pilot. I, I wanted to fly F eighteens at you know at the Naval Academy. That's why I went. Top Gun first uh-huh. one had just come out. I mean, it was great. You're like, oh, this is awesome. I want to be able to fly a jet or be a SEAL. Or uh, but while I went to the academy, my eyes went down to like twenty fifty. Yeah. And you didn't have any recourse. And so that's sort of how I uh, defaulted into medicine. But my now, brother got the good eye, so he's the F-18 pilot. Now, guys get LASIK, I know, now for the teams. Can you get LASIK for <clears throat> flying, too? You can, yeah. Yeah, so you can get uh, PRK, LASIK. They had a bunch of different rules and, and what you can and can't do based, you know, because of the Gs and the pressure and the dive and the unique seal requirements. So it, it's definitely opened it up to more people that just because of eyesight right. couldn't go before. So before you got there, before you went to the Naval Academy, you're going up in high school. What sports did you play? So we did a lot of uh, team sports, basketball, baseball, the usual stuff mm-hmm. uh, around there. Did a lot of skiing, did a lot of backcountry, did a lot of backpacking, did a lot of... Uh, I worked for the Forest Service, actually, and it was with their kind of mountain patrol, mountain rescue. So we're always... I guess it was probably my first introduction to medicine. I, I know one in my family was in medicine, Jocko, so mm-hmm. I had no idea what this was, you know, career was going to take me or what I was going to do. We knew, we knew Navy, we knew military in my family, but... Didn't know medicine. Did you, so did you know from basically this time you started looking at colleges that you were gonna try and go to the Naval Academy? I, I had looked at a bunch of different colleges, but it was it was definitely high on the list. Mm-hmm. Definitely because of Top Gun, because I wanted to fly, right. because I wanted to be a SEAL, because <laughs> I wanted to do these things. <laughs> was it hard to get in? How hard was it to get in? It was hard. Yeah, there's was, was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of extra things you gotta do, but you know, you go through the process, you know what to do, you know how to do the interviews with your congressional, Congressional folks, your senators in the state, and then you do the you know just like another college application. There's a few more hoops you got to jump through. But you were getting good grades this whole time. I was I was do, I was doing fine um, during high school. We had a really uh, good high school, it was a public school that we went to. My parents actually, I mean, it was an amazing sacrifice. They had to drive my brother and I to high school about you know 20, 25, 30 minutes every day, and sometimes we got rides with folks. But I mean, there was no bus service to the high school we went to, so we had to kind of figure that out and after school things and. Now I'm forever indebted and thankful for them to give me that opportunity. And you, but you, you get into the Naval Academy and you show up to uh, plebe summer. How's that go? Uh, miserable. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. Chuck was freaking awful. I was like, I, why? Because this guy does not do well in heat. <laughs> I go to Annapolis, Maryland, and it's like 99 degrees, 100% humidity. And I was like, this is going to put me over the edge. Mm-hmm. I, I'm like, I'm going to be out of here in a week. But, you know, fortunately just uh, was able to find ways around it, find a way to adapt. And you sort of get used to it. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. you deployed forever in different environments and weather and condition and everything. And the, the, the stress of, of weather can't be um, overestimated mm-hmm. in our field, you know, in the military. It's, it's amazing. And so just bleep summer was part of that package for six, seven, eight weeks. And mm-hmm. I, I, th- I thought I was going to like be out of there in a week. What about just like all the, you know, shock and awe of people yelling and screaming? Were you just prepared for that mentally and you knew what was coming? Yeah, I did. You need, and you know, it's not personal, you're like, but it's hard. You're starting, mm-hmm. you know, you're 18 years old, you're starting freshman year and you're like, Oh, what's going on with this? And why are they after me? Why are they singling me out? And Anyway, you know, you're just like, what did I do wrong? I didn't make my turn right, didn't make my bed right, couldn't bounce the right quarter off it. My T-shirts weren't lined up right. There was always something they would find. There was a speck of dust here, there was a speck of dust there. But the what was amazing about that process when you look back, the attention to detail, the ability to quickly memorize facts, figures, information was just Amazing, and my brain sort of worked that way a little bit, mm-hmm. but it certainly got fine tuned there to be able to memorize stuff really quickly. Midshipman Preventure, noon meal, go. What is it? And it changes every noon. Okay, menu feeding meal, go. And we all know that from the Hill Academy, You're like just all these facts and uh, everything you got to memorize there again and again and again. But you're like, why are we doing this stuff? And when you walk away, you're like. That really trained my brain incredibly well. Mm-hmm. So when I went to medical school, it was like yeah. easy. You I, mean, I don't want to say roll. easy, but yeah. it was yeah, I was ready. Yeah. So you you are going through the Naval Academy now, and what was your major? Yeah. So I I, I still wanted to fly. I didn't know you, you have to, you do your medical 
at junior year. Mm-hmm. It's called your pre-commissioning physical. And so I didn't really know my eyes. I was kind of squinting a little bit to see the board. I did have some glasses, but it wasn't that bad. You know, it was, I think it was fixable enough that I could do it. So I, I studied engineering, and it was actually electrical engineering, was of all things. And so... Mm-hmm. Um, not biology, not oceanography, not some of these other majors that could be a little bit uh, more leaning to doing medical as a career. So I was probably the anti-non-medical. And, um, you know, with that, we also did some, you know, leadership positions and other things that, you know, all all of my mentors there, you know, thought I was going into the regular fleet. I was mm-hmm. not, I was going to be a line officer. I wasn't going to be a staff corps, right. medical staff corps. And you're doing, well, you were a rower, right? I was, Jocko, yeah. And then how'd you get into that? So I had done a little bit in uh, New Hampshire growing up, and then I, uh, during plebe summer, they rotate you around through every sport. They make you play squash and go out to do football and baseball and they take you out to the rowing facility and so everyone sort of goes through all these sports every afternoon part of plebe summer it's like a, it's, if it wasn't plebe summer it'd be a great camp because you could do every sport at the naval academy the facilities are amazing and uh that's i was like nah, this is pretty cool boathouse is a good spot i, I like the people here i like the the workout i like the ethic i like the erg machine i like the weights and and, and staying in shape and getting in shape and i, I liked also just being out in the water water guy i like the water that's probably why i picked the navy over mm-hmm. something like air force or west point which i also applied to mm-hmm. so did you get into west point <clears throat> i did yeah did yeah um and i think i, I don't know air force might have waitlisted me or something mm-hmm. but i wasn't going to go there <laughs> so you're doing rowing and but you end up being a pretty good rower is that correct well, you know, and, I mean, Jocko's, you know, Rowan's a team sport, a team team effort, but there's always all these individual tests where they assess you on the erg and all these bench pulls and things like that. And, uh, you know, did did okay. But we, you know, it was a team sport and kind of the ultimate team sport that, that as I think of it, and, you know, certainly others will disagree with me, but the amount of precision required to get, you know, the oar in exactly the right point something milliseconds and it just makes the boat go better it almost lifts and takes off and it's effortless and so to have that precision the strength the application of force at the right time to know the right technique is really uh, it it just appealed to me I I loved rowing my brother also rowed and he he was a very good rower much better than I was and he did some you know Olympic team you know, tryout stuff in and out but I, I did a little bit of national team tryout stuff in and out for the a couple of years after the naval academy and and for a couple of years after so you know they sort of test you and look at how you do on the erg and see how you move the boat and what can you things. roll 500 in to be competitive for that 500 meters yeah so you're probably looking at 130 or under 125 check so 120 now I am not the biggest rower. I was in and out of a lightweight, heavyweight. We have a lightweight category. Mm-hmm. So, you know, my brother make fun of me because he's 6'5 and 225. And he's mm-hmm. not a lightweight. Mm-hmm. So he would uh, crush the erg. But for the my body class, it was a pretty good pretty good mm-hmm. time. And you go to the World Rowing, or the World Erg Championships in Boston they had every year, and you compete against all these people from Denmark. And <laughs> so those were, I mean, th- those were kind of fun to, to see and, 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 it was a great existence for me while I was there at the Naval Academy. I made it a great, a great team, a great sport, and just really completed the package for me there. Are you doing that sport year round? We are at the Naval Academy. Yeah, we are. It really consumed your consumed your life, but in a good way. Mm-hmm. So you said in junior year is when you get your medical, and how long after you get your medical do they look at you and say, "Hey, you can't see well enough to have any of these jobs that you want to have." Right, right away <laughs> they're like here's your list and they just hand you the list and okay where uh, what ship do you want do you want to go marines do you want to do these other things surface warfare officer etc and i said well i mean those are all great i'm not against my dad's surface warfare officers we discussed but i, I didn't know where i, I didn't know really where I, I wanted to go and i had a couple great mentors one of them being this guy, Dean Kelly, my dad goes to me, he's like, Dad, I don't know what to do. I, I, I got disqualified for flight, disqualified for SEAL, all these other things. He's like, all right, go see my chemistry professor there. His name, name was Dean John Kelly. And he was actually my dad's chemistry professor, but he had kind of fleeted up to dean of the entire academic side, civilian mm-hmm. dean, not the military. 
side. They have two sides, a military and a civilian side. And I go in and see Dean John Kelly in his classic meeting. I go in there and Jim and Fletcher reporting. And so, oh, get in here, Fletcher. Let me tell you, talk to you. Yeah, you got some pretty good grades here. You're an electrical engineer. Okay, here's the deal. I pulled your dad's folder. Hold on. He rips his, you know, his classic professor books everywhere, dust, stacks of files and folders, and open it up, and the folder's <clears throat> my dad's. He's like, oh, you're, I tried to get your dad to go to medicine, but he wanted to go be a Marine or something. I don't know. I had something written down. He was in my dad's folder from 1967 or 8 or something like that before he graduated. He's like, you ever thought about medicine? And he's like, well, my dad sent me here to talk to you. You, see, you got a great connection with him. And it's amazing that you're still here. And he's like, well, I, I run the medical program here at Naval Academy. We allow 15 graduates a year to service select medical. And I said, tell me more about that, sir. I'm very interested. What was it that was in your mind? Cause, <laughs> because that, they couldn't have sold me on the medical program. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> so so you, did you have some like nascent thought about being a doctor at some point? Only that we did some ski patrol stuff. We did some of that mountain patrol, the Forest Service. We took some of these wilderness, you know, first aid courses mm -hmm. that you had to do to be able to do that. That was really my only introduction. I had no idea, like, even how long medical school was, <laughs> what it was, or how to do it, or what even a residency. I had no clue about any of this stuff. And they take 15 people. 15 out of about 1,200 ish or so mm -hmm. we graduate. Yeah. So you decide at that point, like, that's what it took? Did you, that was it? I did, but I, you know, to be honest, I was, I was a little nervous about it because I had a couple jobs. I had a leadership job. I was, I was a deputy brigade commander, the second in command of the, at the time, we're trying to sort through it and had uh, this guy, Colonel Terry Murray, who was uh, very well known. He's became, went on to become a general, but he was colonel at the time. He was the deputy commandant and the commandant of midshipmen and the superintendent and you get to know these folks through all these leadership events and you go and have uh, you know just incredible opportunities at that place you know you're like preventure get over here you need to go to dinner at the superintendent so i'm like oh what's going on i gotta go study i just tired i'm just worked out <laughs> just finished rowing you're like well it's uh, margaret thatcher you gotta go hang out you know mm -hmm. so you get like some really cool experiences looking back when you're at a 15 person dinner and you know a couple midshipmen there and they yanked you to go so I, I, i'm very very thankful for that but, but at the end of the day I, I still still had no idea what the hell i was getting into so then what's the application process like to get into the medical program yeah so i i, I finished up at the Naval Academy, not to, to bore you with too many details, but I didn't have all the requirements. I was going to say, did they make you start yeah. taking other classes it's, on biology or whatever? Yeah, and I did, but I didn't have enough time. And so Dean Kelly was like, Preventure, you got to graduate electrical engineering. We need, you know, we got to keep our electrical engineering graduate numbers up. We've got some site visits from whatever <laughs> academic organization follows colleges or whatever. And you got to, we'd love for you to stay and graduate double E. And then we'll find a way to make it happen that you can finish up your requirements and take biology and organic chemistry and a couple others. I actually had most of them. You know, the well-roundedness of the education in the Naval Academy is amazing. So I had almost all of them, but I needed a couple. Mm -hmm. And so it actually worked out that I was going to be uh, trying out rowing, working with the U.S. national team uh, out of Boston and Philadelphia, Princeton, San Diego. We had a couple different setups going on. And, but mostly based out of Boston, and that's where I started taking my classes after I graduated and worked, worked there. Uh, I was in the Navy. So they gave you some kind of a normal job, some kind of a gap-filled job, and you, then you could go to school. Where were you going to school? I went to uh, Boston College, Boston University, just took these just took whatever classes, classes, classes with a bunch of freshmen and <laughs> sophomores. It was great. It was great. And in the meantime, you're applying to medical school. In the meantime, I'm applying to medical school. So and then you get into medical school. I do get into medical school. I, I was a little worried because I was taking all these, you have to take this ridiculously long, like seven hour test called the MedCat, which is the mm -hmm. medical college admission test. And it's, I, I look back on that now and I was like, I, I, I didn't have really biology when I took the test. I never did, so I kind of learned it on my own. And I, I did, I didn't blow it out of the water, but I did okay to get some looks at, at schools. And then 
I ended up um, getting in several places, not a lot. I got rejected at a bunch, and I was like, oh, this sucks. What am I going to do? And the Navy's, the Navy's calling me, and they're like, hey, we need to get a – we need to see a letter of admission from a medical school or we've got a ship for you waiting, uh, Ensign <laughs> Preventure, down here in Newport, Rhode Island. You're going to go to SWAS. So the we USS nice Never Dock. <laughs> you, you got it. And I was like, oh, dang it, I, I got to get this letter. And so I finally got into a couple schools and was able to uh, get them the letter. And then where'd you end up going? Did you end up going to Dartmouth? That's I did, right? Jocko. Yeah, I went back up to uh, my roots up in New Hampshire, up at Dartmouth, and I was uh, four years of medical school up there, and I loved every minute. How great. crazy was that? You go from the, being a plebe and then a midshipman at the Naval Academy, you got people yelling at you and all these uniforms you got to wear all day. Uh, did you have to do any of that at, at Dartmouth? No, zero. <laughs> no, in zero. fact, I, well, well, actually, the only thing I did was kind of fun stuff. They made you do like 45 days of active duty training because mm-hmm. I was on a four-year deferment for medical uh, for medical school so didn't wear the uniform i think i are you getting your navy pay you getting an ensign pay no no not at all now if i had gone to the military medical school usus in bethesda that you would be active duty during that time so i was oh. not active duty for four years so they basically and, and it's a great deal it's called hpsp but it's a scholarship for those listening out there it's a great deal i mean they i got out of you know undergrad and med school with no debt, mm-hmm. zero. And they, they, you're not getting paid a lot. I mean, you get a few hundred bucks a month, but they're covering tuition, books, and fees, which ain't cheap. What about housing? No, just they give you a stipend per month. Check. It's a I little had, bit different When I was now, reading your yeah. bio, I was like, oh, he was going there with a big fat paycheck. <laughs> I didn't know that you they, they took your uh, pay away from you. That's rough. Yeah, it was a little, it was a little, it was a little rough. I, I, I took a small loan, you know, which obviously has since paid off, but uh, j- just just to get through Dartmouth. But it, but it, it was a it was a great four years there. I didn't I didn't have to get my hair cut every you know <laughs> 10, 14 days down at the midshipman barber shop. I you know maybe cut it every <laughs> three to six months and <laughs> just just did a lot of other stuff and, and and focused on med school and and living back up in New Hampshire. How far from like where you grew up? What were you at Dartmouth? Yeah, it, was, it was about two hours. Oh, so you were going home for Christmas and Thanksgiving oh, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, probably more, more often than that, like like mom's cooking. <laughs> and how hard is medical school for you? It must have seemed like a little bit of a breeze. I mean, honestly, I know it was hard and all that, but compared to being at the Naval Academy where you had these tests and uniforms and inspections and all this other stuff going on and you're rowing, like you had a lot of stuff going on at the Naval Academy. Now there's like, oh, no, all you have to do is study. Yeah, the, well, Jago, the most interesting thing for me was, you know, at the Naval Academy, you've got no choice. You, you've got to go to class. And you don't go, the only way you can get out of class is if you have a movement order where you're going on a rowing race. You've mm-hmm. got a varsity rowing competition up at Princeton or San Diego or whatever. That's the only way you're, you're getting out of it. So I get to Dartmouth and they're like, Hey, are you, are you even going to go to class? <laughs> are you going to show up? Are you going to I'm like, what? I don't know what this means. And anyway, I, I went to a lot of the classes, but not, not all my classmates did. I, I just, I just learned well that way. I was engaged. You're locked in. You're, <laughs> You know, following the process, you're with the you're with the professors and, and and learning alongside them. So, I didn't go to everything though, and which kind of nice. I didn't have to like sign all these like movement order things yeah. to get out of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Is there, do they have like fraternities up there? They do for uh, undergrads. I, I wanted to I wanted to join one, you know, somehow because <laughs> I didn't have it as an undergrad. <laughs> but they rejected you because you were a yeah, post grad. Too old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> looked, looked to me kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> now, did you, while you're there, do you is that when you picked orthopedics? I did. Yeah, and and so th- this is interesting. I you know you you meet these great people that help steer your career along the way, and I know. You've had that Jocko and you make decisions and you don't know, like going to see John Kelly and going to medical school. Well, I got injured, you know, rowing. It's not like it's like being a SEAL and all the injuries you get or an NFL player, but or playing football in college. But I, I had a couple injuries that took me out for a little bit of time in, in rowing and, and during some critical times. And so I went to see one of my first mentors who I learned was this guy, uh, uh, Captain Eddie McDevitt. He was the head orthopedic surgeon at the Naval Academy and took care of all the sports injuries and I learned what is this this is kind of cool and so what I didn't tell you is you know it was a little easier for me to select medicine because mm-hmm. I had Dr. McDevitt there to help say this is a pretty cool career you know you can do this and be a part of a you know great community and give back and mm-hmm. do orthopedics and, and serve the Navy in other ways and so it was really good to have that mentor but 
he helped he helped me see what sort of sports medicine and orthopedics was and and I said this is this is really cool now of course I dated a bunch of other specialties like dermatology and plastic surgery echo charles we talked about that for your biceps <laughs> sure. we talked about bicep implants <laughs> over there uh, other 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 things uh, ENT and ophthalmology but I, I i wanted to use my hands i wanted mm-hmm. to use my hands in a craft whether if i couldn't be using my hands to be a sealer i couldn't do it because i couldn't be a pilot to use my hands i wanted to use my hands mm-hmm. and that's the weird thing about orthopedics is you're basically a carpenter or a yeah. welder yeah like Car- you have a job to piece things back together carpentry class 101 and that's so full circle and you don't realize these things you put them together in the, in your life or and you take a step back and take a 30,000 foot view of your life and like how your passion and your energy and your drive sort of leads you to these things this was a no-brainer for me because I was an engineer I loved trying to figure things out I loved trying to put stuff together to figure out metal on metal interactions, implant strengths, the strength of the anchor we were going to use to fix your biceps, Jocko. We know the exact Newtons and the strength and the suture and the material and what it's made out of. And I was able to walk the walk and talk the talk because I knew the language of engineering. And so for me, orthopedics was kind of this full circle I've arrived. Now, in the civilian world, you'd go when you get done, and correct me if I'm wrong because I don't know, but in the civilian world, you'd get done with medical school and then you go do your residency, right? That's correct. The, that's the right, Pattern? Yep, that's correct. So that's Jacob. basically what you do at this juncture in your career. You get done with Dartmouth, you graduate, you get your degree, and then you go to do your, is it your, do they call it your residency when you go to, because you went to Balboa, right? They do, yeah, I did. I went, I, so Balboa was in San Diego. Uh, it's one of the largest naval hospitals uh, in the world. There's really three big teaching hospitals. There's Balboa, San Diego, uh, there's Bethesda, and then Portsmouth, Virginia. And in essence, I was gonna go to one of those three. And one thing you do at the Naval Academy is after your freshman year, you have to go do 30, 60 days on a ship. Mm-hmm. And so in- A little the, summer cruise, they You call got it, so yeah, exactly. So. Um, Sophomore summer cruise, youngster cruise. That's a youngster as a sophomore at the academy. And so you go on youngster cruise, and guess where they sent me? The kid from New Hampshire. They brought him all the way out west to San Diego, and I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I mean, this is unbelievable. You got surfing. You got good water. It's not freezing. I can go in the water year-round. It's not just three months a year in New Hampshire when the water's cold. And I was like, this is amazing. And so that sort of guided my way to get to San Diego mm-hmm. after. Because they, they were going to, just like I got the letter, you're, you're either going to med school or we got a ship for you, Ensign Preventure. Now I'm Lieutenant Preventure, and you're going to be either going to San Diego, Bethesda, or Portsmouth. You let us know your choices. You, you don't always get your first choice. Fortunately, I did, and mm-hmm. just all worked out. So that's where, this is 1998 when you get out here for the first time? This is 98, Jocko, yep. And... Now you're just you you check into uh, Balboa. Is this the residency like my friend Dr. Peter Atia who did his residency at, at Johns Hopkins and it was you, you tell he tells the stories of just no sleep, you know, working thirty six and forty eight hour shifts. Was it like that at Balboa for your residency? Or was there was there some kind of control? <laughs> yeah, no. It's, so what's interesting is there there are quite a few controls now, and we call it the quote unquote 80 hour work week, which you're supposed to adhere to as a 80 as a hour work week. You're supposed to adhere to an 80 hour work week. But I can tell you oh, during my entire training, we had none of those rules. We had no 80 hour work week. We had 110, 120 hours. You're on the call night after night, maybe a day off. We, we were, we were busy mm-hmm. and it was a, uh, it was a significant, uh, <laughs> burden on you know the the family a burden on you know just being away and and just time and on your your body and we, we do it so much better now mm-hmm. in what we call graduate medical education gme it's done so much better now in, in the united states than than what we did but it certainly taught you the craft really well and 
but sometimes function. I mean, as you know, in your your field, Jocko, it's not always the best to be functioning on you know zero sleep, mm-hmm. and you're on your fifty fifth hour. It's yeah, just it, not the best. It's pretty disturbing, actually, when you think about these young doctors and they're getting they're they're awake for fifty five hours and they're making a decision on what they're going to do, cutting you open, right? That doesn't seem like the best plan. Was that just like a cultural thing? Was that a cultural thing where hey, that's how it was for me and that's how it's going to be for you too? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that certainly is a part of it. Unfortunately, you know, the wake up call came where we're now able to really re- uh, regulate it. You can only be on call so much. If you're on call, you got to go home by a certain time the next day, which is basically you know late morning. So the, that rest and recovery, which we know is so important in sleep, talk to Parsley, mm-hmm. is so important. And, and, and you're just better at your craft at the end of the day. So what's your job like when you get to Balboa? And this is so this is 1998, 1999. There's no war going on. No. You're dealing with kind of normal Injuries like family injuries people, you know accidentally, you know cut themselves with a knife and they come in or they break their leg on the Playground or playing basketball. That's what you're dealing with at this point all, all of the above. Yeah, yeah, for sure And in the first you are I mean you're at the very bottom of the rung. I mean you're the intern so your mm. first year of internship and I, There's a little bit of uncertainty in the Navy and if, if the Navy taught me anything it was certainly patience and you don't have to rush into everything and I've got a lot of you know, folks are able to mentor now. They're like, oh, I want this, I got this, I got to get done with that. I'm like, calm down. It's okay. You're going to get there. And I, after my internship year, the Navy sent me to Okinawa, Japan for a year. Mm-hmm. And I went kicking and screaming because guess what? All my friends from Dartmouth, they're going straight through into residency. It's five years of orthopedic training. I want to get through this. I've done this. I did, you know, like, I want to get done with it. But it ended up being one of the best years and the maturity and the people you meet and taking care of the. What were you doing in Japan? You're a general medical officer. You're, <clears throat> you, know, you could be a flight surgeon, you could be a dive medical officer, but I opted to do the GMO route, which is a general medical route, and so they assigned me to a Marine base mm-hmm. in Okinawa, Camp Courtney. And <laughs> this is funny. They actually said, all right, Preventure, you went to the Naval Academy. Um, I got a few of you here, but you're the only one doing this GMO Marine Corps thing. And you got to be able to salute. I know you know how to salute, okay? So you're going to go to Camp Courtney, which is basically the headquarter realm in Okinawa mm-hmm. because you're going to be walking around this base and you're going to be at least salute. representing us well and know how to salute because you went to the Naval Academy. And so I think that's how I ended up there, <laughs> at least what my boss told me. So I went to Camp Courtney and uh, I, would, I was not entirely happy about it. I wanted to continue on residency, but that's just not how it worked then. And we went, went to Okinawa, and it ended up being the best year. It was just incredible, and the experiences. And that's because you were in a position where you were kind of the guy. That's right. And you were the one that was answering the mail on whatever injuries were coming across. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, you, you're you're kind of like the town doc, you know, mm-hmm. right there. And they, but I don't know a ton. I know enough, and you know when to refer. But I've been through, like, one year of residency in, 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 in sur- you know, surgical type of residency. And... I don't, I don't have any specialty at this point. I'm not mm-hmm. an orthopedic surgeon, and fortunately, you got the hospital there. You can refer. You know when to refer, and you got a, you got a great team behind you. But what was great, Jock, is you have all the corpsmen, and the corpsmen you were embedded with, mm-hmm. and the ability to teach and train and work alongside with just such great professionals in Navy corpsmen was unbelievable and, and and something I'll never forget and we, we did all these training things and we'd go out and camp and do simulated uh, blast wounds and simulated heart attacks and train 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 drill 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 it's the same thing you know team guys are doing same team we're doing to prepare our craft and for the next emergency so where are you when 9-11 happens so I'm in residency, and we're at, at Balboa when 9-11 went So down. you're back from Japan in Balboa? Back in residency at Balboa, yes. What, what are your thoughts when this happens? My brother called me. He's like, turn the TV on. <laughs> I was like, ooh. And he's active duty F-18 pilot He's active pilot duty 18 pilot, and he's getting ready to get shipped, you know, mm-hmm. spinning up a carrier right away, and he had a lot of activity over there. Mm-hmm. Um so saw the TV, you're sort of protected during this residency time, although there's been precedent in other significant conflicts in the past, uh, Vietnam, Korea, otherwise there, they've pulled people out of residency to go assist 
the war effort. Mm-hmm. And so that was always on the table. Uh, they wanted us to finish residency first. So, of course, there was the initial flurry. We didn't actually see, you know, after you got through the 9-11 and all the lockdown and all the stuff and, you know, everything sort of dust sort of settles, it wasn't that busy until a couple years later. And that's when things started really ramping up for us at Balboa. So, so you're here in Balboa in like 2004, 2005. This is when we're in Iraq. This is when the Marines are, because you're seeing almost all Marines, I'm, I'm assuming. For these wounds, yeah, for sure. Because the Army would go to, they'd come home to different, to, to Army hospitals, but Marines are going to come to the Navy hospitals. Yeah, it was, you know, it was interesting. This is when the medevac system was, <laughs> it, it was there, but, you know, to my knowledge, and I don't want to speak out of turn, it was, it hadn't been turned on mm-hmm. now, but it had to get refined. And how do you get someone back from Afghanistan to North Island, to Miramar, as quick as possible, as safely as possible, and get them to the higher echelon of care after they're stabilized in theater. And that, that was, you know, imagine a, a massive amount of work and tri-service collaboration to make that happen and a massive team effort, which really the innovations that came out of this to, to transport injured men and women from overseas that were service-membered and injured what was amazing. And the, the innovations that came out of that, such as, the hot pocket a to keep you warm when you lose blood guess mm-hmm. what you get hypothermic <clears throat> and so you want to be able to keep their heat up keep them um, normal thermic as they say maybe a little bit warmer and so really cool hot pocket design and so patients are treated in these things called hot pockets and that came out of it a, a better wound vacuum mm-hmm. a wound vacuum that you're able to put on blast wounds right away was really fine-tuned and innovated during this conflict. I can't even tell you how many wound vacuums we would change out every day, every night, because we would know at Balboa when patients were coming in, approximately how many were coming in, what your call night looked like. So you talk about those duty hour things. We had some really long nights, but it was a team effort. And we had some great uh, trauma surgeons that uh, worked with us, orthopedic trauma, general trauma, and but we didn't really have a system when it first started. And then we got the C5 system, which was a combat casualty care system, which really helped leverage all of the all of the important aspects of, of caring for our, our wounded warriors when they came back. So I imagine that when the Kazavak birds or Medivac birds are coming back, these are C17s, they're coming back with a lot of wounded personnel on them so are you getting like 20 people at a time 30 people at a time coming in there were nights with that fortunately not every night Mm -hmm. fortunately not every month but there would be nights with i would say the routine was during those years you mentioned two three four a night so if you were on call you were heading it up you had your residents that were with you and and if we had more that we knew were coming guess what you took all the night before you volunteered and just took it again and we just we just took care of it but it was it it, it was tough it was tough to see these um young young men young women with you know blown off limbs blown off legs blown off ankles x fixes on which are like these erector sets you put on their legs and arms and pelvis to stabilize their bones stabilize their vessels it the survivability developed by many of my colleagues out there and the innovations they developed increased dramatically during this conflict and it really helped save lives. So we were seeing things back at our tertiary care center at somewhere like Balboa or Bethesda or Portsmouth or San Antonio where most of the Kazavac was that we weren't seeing in the past. You weren't necessarily seeing this stuff in Vietnam. And so you pull the war trauma books from Vietnam, there's a lot of great stuff out there, but people like you know, Captain Dana Covey and John Webster and Mike Masaryk and some of these other great trauma folks and, and leaders that I worked with really helped develop this system to bring uh, orthopedics a little bit closer to the fight so they could get stabilized and then have it super fine-tuned, slick system when they got to some place like Balboa. When you're um, looking at a wound, let's say 
pre 9 11, you're at Balboa, there's a car accident, you know, a bad car accident. What's that wound compared to someone that was in a Humvee, armored Humvee, unarmored Humvee, and they they hit a, hit a roadside bomb, they hit an IED? What's the difference between those two scenarios from a medical perspective? Yeah, that's a really important question. And as you alluded earlier, the, the stuff we were taking care of, motor vehicle accidents, broken femur, a broken ankle, uh, falling from a first story window. I mean, there were certainly some pretty bad injuries we saw and, and you're going 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. But what you weren't accounting for with the IED blast wounds was everything else that went into it. The, the magnitude, the basic just shock, the awe that went into it, the materials that would go into these IEDs, the stuff we were pulling out of uh, these wounded warriors' bodies was, it was beyond disheartening, to be honest with you. Um, safety pins, uh, cut up knives, uh, coat hangers, metal, cut into a gazillion different pieces and sharpened. And it just, I, we kept a little glass bowl in our, in our offices of stuff we had kind of taken out and sterilized to remind us you know what was what, what was some of these folks had gone through and 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 and, and lived through a lot of them and, and some that that didn't it was really disheartening how what is it like when you're living where did you live in san diego we lived <laughs> we lived in lived in Coronado. So you live in yeah. Coronado, yeah. probably one of the most beautiful, uh, picturesque places in the world to live. You turn on the TV, you see that there's a war going on, but you walk outside and it's seventy degrees and sunny. You get in your car, you drive to Balboa, and you see these these wounded warriors that are just devastated by these wounds, and you're doing that day in day out. What what is what is that like from a I don't want to say a psychological perspective because I don't want to get too like crazy as if I'm a psychologist, but that has to be an interesting dynamic to be living in San Diego. It's 75 degrees and sunny. It's a beautiful day. You flip on the TV. You see that the push is going into Fallujah. You see the push is going into Ramadi. You see Talafar. You, you, oh, you see that this is happening. I mean, I can only imagine when you see the Marines going into Fallujah in 2004, you're thinking, okay, we got, we got to be ready, and then sure enough, 24, 48 hours later, you're getting, you start to receive these wounded warriors. What is that? What is that like when you think back on that time period? It had to be, it had to be, had to be very, um, almost like a, a surreal moment to 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 watch something on TV, and then deal with these wounded warriors. Yeah, no, no question, Jocko. The the ability, first of all, the ability, my, my hat's off again to the medevac system because that has saved lives. And the ability to get these folks back in 48, 72, 96 hours and sometimes a stop in Bethesda, sometimes a stop in San Antonio. But the, the military did a great job of trying to bring these wounded warriors back closer to their families, back closer to where they deployed from, back closer to Camp Pendleton, because they knew and we knew that the the, the mental um, strain on, on them, their families, and the, and the injuries were were extreme. It, it was real, and I can say the same thing for many of my colleagues at Balboa. Whether you're general surgeon, orthopedic trauma surgeon. I was an orthopedic sports surgeon, so we, we did a lot of this stuff and a lot of the reconstructions, but the real you know heroes were some of the orthopedic trauma surgeons, the general surgeons, and my, my hats, off, hats off to them, uh, plastics, the uh, mental health providers, all, all of C5, the combat casualty care set up at, at Balboa did, did an amazing job, but you know there are nights, I, I personally at least talk, I'd get off call and you'd be like, oh, you know, let's fix the fourth external fixator, I put on the... 10th wound vac, we've done this and fixed the stump of the leg just above the knee and they have no elbow and you're putting these wound vacs and X fixes on and it's, 
the the flesh, the burning flesh, the hearing the helicopter, the, these things that you know we all kind of go through. It's it became a little PTSD like in a way. Now, fortunately, you mentioned Coronado. One of the things that my personal strategies was when I went over the bridge from Balboa to San Diego to Coronado. I tried to use that as a decompressed time. The, the time over the bridge, the time there to go back to my family to decompress because there were some there were some tough days in the medical team that was caring for these heroes. Mm-hmm. And and your your family at this point consisted of how many kids did you have? Your wife and wife and uh, two at the time, no four, so four soon after, and they were all you know of course very young and living in Coronado and. Um, you know, really great setup and great, you know, friends and military friends and pilots and you know, all my friends on Naval Academy, for example, you know, they're, they're pilots and doing helicopters or jets or on ships or subs or what have you or PAOs or, or all, all these certain things on, on top of not, not to mention all the SEALs that, you know, about 20, 25 a year that the, the Naval Academy put out based on uh, based on billets each year. So. It was really great to have that network also for my wife and, and my family and you know for, for all of us to have and, and just just lean on did you ever feel like you wanted to yell at everyone that there's a war going on <laughs> I, I, I did I, I but I know so many had, had lived through it and, and to be honest so much so many did way way more than than I ever did mm-hmm. and so I was just trying to you know, put my put my hat on of let's do whatever I can do to help out these wounded warriors because mm-hmm. the usual thing when I would go to their bedside and talk and meet them, whether it was in the emergency room or C5 or talking about reconstructing their knee or their shoulder, Doc, when can I get back? Mm-hmm. When can I go in the fight again? When can I join my unit? It, it was the most amazing thing to me, the esprit de corps, the leadership exhibited out there to put that together. I mean, realize that it's like, Mm -hmm. you want to go back to that? And that was almost always the first question. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, I know that I got home from my last deployment and I just was probably been home for less than a day and was going to grab something to eat with my wife and I'm just walking down um, the street in OB, in Ocean Beach, and I just remember looking, and n- there was clearly, for no one on this street, there was no war going on. There was no war going on. They were doing what they were doing. And I remember thinking to myself, I kind of, I was like thinking, I should just tell all these people, hey, you know, there's a, there's a freaking war going on right now, and you should be appreciative of the fact that you're standing in line to get an ice cream. And then I remember thinking, you know what? that's my job and that's the way it is and I just kind of like accepted the fact that these people are never gonna think about it they're never gonna think about it that three miles away in Balboa there's a young marine that's struggling to stay alive or struggling to keep his leg and or he's gonna lose his leg or lose his arm or whatever and they can just just kind of ignore it it's um it's it's very it's it's a dichotomy inside this country that's can be if you if you let it make you angry it can definitely make you angry if you let it get to you it can definitely get to you but if you look at it you know I I remember one time uh well, one of my kids you know told me that the Wi-Fi in their bedroom wasn't strong enough you know and I thought to myself, well, I guess I'm doing a decent job as a dad if the biggest struggle you have is that the Wi-Fi in your room, you only have four <laughs> bars, right? <laughs> four bars. And, you know, I thought, and then I said to myself, you know, as these kids get older, you know, I'm going to make sure that they understand that there's a lot more important things and there's people that, there's people in the world that have uh, a lot less, a lot, a lot bigger things to worry about than you do. So I kind of got that feeling too for the country, like, okay, you know, they're, they're going to stand in line. They're going to get ice cream, and it would be nice if they recognized. And I think that's one of the one of the reasons that I do this podcast is just so people can hear from people that have served, people that have sacrificed, or hear stories of people that have served and people that have sacrificed. And that's why I mean, you know, 
even as I'm sitting here thinking about you, you're you're in Coronado, like I said, one of the most picturesque places in the world. You got your family. Your family's doing what families do, right? They're playing their sports and they're hanging out. They're going to the beach, and yet every day you've got to go in and and put these broken guys back together again. And there's that constant daily reminder of of what's going on in the world and how just how totally different these these worlds can be and it's it's really important for people to pay attention to that and understand that that there's a lot of suffering going on and even though maybe your little bubble of the world is 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 happy just pay attention to the fact that there's a lot of suffering going on out there when did you start working with NSW yeah, so that uh, actually started about 2003-ish, I would say, 2002-03. Uh, one of my mentors, a guy named Mike Langlerthy, was down and, and working with NSW from an orthopedic standpoint and doing 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 some stuff with them and, and have being available. And he actually uh, you know left Balboa, and so I... <laughs> Was in Coronado. I said, "Well, I, I raised, do you want to do you want to go?" And I said, "Raise my hand." And I'm like, "Sure. What do we do?" You know, he's like, "I don't know anything." You know, at this point about the, the the training room or you know what the medical setup was. You know, we're still dealing with all, all the stuff and the blast wounds we, we we just talked about. And but we had this concept which was bring our skill set closer to the fleet, and that was San Diego wide. We had smart clinics in Miramar and uh, down the 32nd Street, a, a smart clinic being a sports medicine and rehabilitation type of clinic because why a lot of the injuries we see were musculoskeletal in the military. It's an unending pipeline of 18, 19, 20-year-olds coming to the military and they're jacking themselves up playing basketball or whether they're deployed. And so... There's a lot of musculoskeletal burden in, in the military, and I felt it was a really important, and so did many of my colleagues, that, that we brought it and made it easier. Like, go to Balboa, get a parking spot, deal with the parking situation up there, and get an appointment. And you know, before you know it, you're gone from the command for six hours. No, to go. Coming from a guy in the teams, going yeah. to Balboa for anything <laughs> was the worst nightmare ever. Like, I'd, I'd rather just suffer. I'd rather just sit over here and limp around yeah. and let it just be broken than have to go to Balboa, which is going to take <laughs> five hours. Yeah, but that's, I mean, that's a fair assessment, Jocko. Yeah. And we, we didn't, you know, that wasn't, our, our goal was always to serve the fleet the best. And this was on top of doing the smart clinics and taking care of the Marines because, you know, they were getting banged up, taking care of, you know, all the men and women, not only in Marine Corps, but in the Navy down 32nd Street out at Point Loma and bringing us to see clinic alongside our incredible family practice sports medicine colleagues, our physical therapists, our athletic trainers. All of this was really starting to be born here in a nice way in San Diego. Let's face it, we have so many great commands here. We do everything here in San Diego from the Navy. And so we wanted to be able to deliver that, make it easy, take Jocko's six hour trip to Balboa, which he would never come. And then, <laughs> then he'd really rip his biceps and we'd have to fix it. But it would be you know, something that you know I was certainly passionate about. And so this was another one of our things where we delivered it to the fleet. But me being in Coronado, I would often, you know, put my bike on, get the mm -hmm. helmet on my bike so I can get on base, never wore a helmet in my beach cruiser around San Diego. And uh, went and met uh, met Jason and uh, people like Mark Rogo and, and others there. And we we had a great had a great situation. It, it, it was amazing. And I and my hat's off to people like Jason where, I don't know, Jocko, you were in the closet where he started. And then, yeah. you, then you went to the trailer and this said uh, the closet i mean this is like where the rehab right. athletic training facility you know training room was yeah somebody in nsw and i wish i knew who it was it's it's weird it, when when something gets developed in nsw and i've been using the term nsw that's naval special warfare that encompasses all of the special operations elements within the within the u.s navy and so when something happens in nsw i can tell you right now 
a human being had to take that thing and force it to happen. And it took them years to get a foothold. Whoever, and I don't know who it is, maybe you do, whoever decided, all right, we're gonna do some kind of a human performance, we're gonna get athletic trainers in here, we're gonna get the guys healed up, we're gonna do injury prevention with them. Whoever started that probably had to work for two and a half years and finally were able to hire one guy and put him in this you know, little tiny maintenance closet in the back of a command somewhere. That's how things start. And so whoever that was, thank you. And was Jason the first guy that got hired? He, he was one of the earliest okay. for sure. So we, he got extracted out of Major League Baseball, unfortunately, just, just a great individual. And he's still with, with yeah. the teams as I still GS text, now. I still text Jason. If I get dinged up, I text him like, hey, bro, here my, <laughs> rolled my ankle, pretty swollen. Here's a picture. What should I do? You know, <laughs> I still do that to this day with Jason. And he still responds and says, hey, if you need me to come out and look at it, like that guy cares about his patients to a degree that's just incredible. And he's done that for all of, like every guy that would get injured, could get surgery, get banged up. He was just there committed to him all the time. And then and then the rest of the team followed suit. That's what you got. We got this incredible group together that would provide this amazing service. And they also had a different, you know, you go to a regular doctor and the regular doctor might think, oh, you got hurt cool, we'll get you as much time off as we can. But the SEAL attitude is I got hurt and I wanna get back in the game tonight. Like I gotta, I wanna go tonight. Oh, you can't go tonight? Tomorrow I wanna get back in the game. So Jason and the rest of the team understood that their mission and their goal and our goal was to get back to work. And that's a lot different than preserving, you know, I'm gonna be per- in perfect shape and everything's gonna be hunky-dory, I mean, it's not gonna be that way. If you're in the SEAL teams, just like in, in MMA fighting, you don't get to go into a fight 100%. You don't get to do, like you're gonna be injured, you're gonna be sore, you're gonna have a, a, a bruised rib, you're gonna have a tweaked neck, your shoulder's gonna be sore. That's the way it's gonna be and you still gotta go out there and fight. And I think Jason and the rest of the team, you guys realized, all right, we need to make sure these guys can get the job done, but we can't, they're, they're not gonna allow themselves to be babied and coddled. No question. And uh, you, you talk about the classic conundrum. And this is this is what we knew. And this is what we were working on. And th- this was not all my baby or even a small fraction of it, but a, you know, a great team. And I remember us going out after work. One day I got a call, hey, meet us at McPee's in a bar in Coronado. And we sat down and said, what does this look like? And to your point, two and a half, three years later, mm-hmm. this is what it looked like. And, and so that was the first thing we, we sort of penciled out. And, you know, I was just one small cog in the wheel from some of the musculoskeletal side. But we had so many other, you know, great people from, you know, from Jason, Mark Rogo, and uh, Vinny, and m- many others. Yeah, Doc there. Parsley was in Parsley, there. Parsley, yeah. I mean, there's so many, there's so many I'm forgetting, and I apologize if I do, but the tactical athlete program got born. It was a tap program. And that's, you know, now it's on to the next iteration, which you know, I hope we can talk about because that's really now, I think the future of taking care of our military members, our most important commodity, the human element mm-hmm. at, a, at the best level. And so we literally napkin sketch this things out. What components, what have you seen? What do you, you talk to colleagues that have done pro sports teams, taken care of uh, the Rams and all these other organizations? And how can we affect this for the teams to make a guy like Jocko, who does not want to go to medical, can't stand it, but actually wants to come in and get some wellness, get some injury prevention so that you can go out and operate and do your job better. That was our goal. And literally no one would come in and see us. But over time, the switch has flipped and now it's a really impressive program and that's what's going on down there. So the tactical athlete program that you guys sketched out, that was focused on athletic trainers, like the the sleep people, they started looking at hormones, they started looking at everything to try and get the guys up to speed. And I saw it grow, like you said, from Jason, and it just escalated, escalated, escalated till we had a, a good, a, a freaking world class. 
The other in- interesting thing was I remember talking to, I think this guy was a person that worked at Bud's, but it's a, it's a similar thing. And he had come from some professional sports team, I think the NFL, and he had said, you know, when I was in the NFL, every six months I'd see one uh, patella femoral syndrome, which is, you know, a problem that you get with your knee. He says, here, I saw nine yesterday. <laughs> like the amount of injuries that guys yeah. get is crazy. And so you yeah. you guys in this department got so much experience working on the shoulders, working on the knees, working on the lower back, working on the elbows, working on the wrists, working on the neck. Like the guys are just dinged up to a point that, and you know, people talk about the NFL, how long, what's the average NFL uh, guy plays what? Like six years six. is like the average? Yeah. Three, three point. Eight. Three point eight something. Yeah, depending so on your you're, position. You're getting yeah. dinged up. Well, the seals. We most guys stay in. Yeah. Like, look, some guys get out at six years or whatever. Most guys stay in. Most guys do twenty years at least, and they're they're doing deployment after deployment after workup after workup after deployment after. So these guys are getting dinged up, and yet they still want to play that game. They still want to get in there, and so you guys put this together. What were some of the key components that you would say for for cuz this is what, you know, so many people that listen to this podcast, they they want to they want to perform better. They want that longevity. They want to be they want to optimize what they're doing. What are the some of the things that you saw that help guys out? Yeah, Jack, well, I I think you mentioned a lot of it and and the we, we broke it down into, you know, kind of big buckets where you sort of how do we optimize physical readiness. If you ask big Navy, big military, what is it all about from the medical side for carrying that active duty? It's all about readiness. Your people ready. Can they go? Are they ready to go? It's almost just like being a head team position for the NFL. Can, mm-hmm. can they go? Can you, are they ready? So physical, mental, and then uh, more of a, of a cognitive type of thing with sleep and other things uh, baked in there. Nutrition was a big one. But really trying to organize the elements of all of this into a, a program that made sense and a program that you and your colleagues would, would buy into. We didn't want to set up a you know brick and mortar facility without you wanting to go and, and be a part of it. And so we had to have the, the right mindset, the, the right culture, because that really wasn't in there. You, were, you went to medical, Preventure was going to write you a chit, and you're getting four months of limb-do, and you're biceps operated on and you're out for a while you know and that's that's not going to happen unacceptable no it's not, it's not it's not going to happen i can tell you it didn't even matter what i you know what what shit i sort of wrote you know fixing pecs and this and that and shoulders and knees I, like where's uh where's master chief so-and-so oh well uh, sir he's deployed <laughs> he's only four weeks out of his ac joint shoulder massive reconstruction yeah, I know, sir, but he had to go. Yeah. Yeah, he just had to go. I'm like, okay, <laughs> see him when he gets back. <laughs> Unfortunately, I guess my point is uh, you, you and your colleagues, Jaco, tested out the, the strength of what we did, the strength of our repairs. We're always testing things in orthopedics. Back to my engineering days of what is this strong enough? Is this going to ho- hold Echo Charles biceps together? Is it mm-hmm. going to be strong enough? Is it going to hold Master Chief so and so's? AC joint together right. and because they're going to go early. I, I can't necessarily control that. The command has ultimate authority. I can make, we make recommendations from medical to the command. You get limited duty and all this kind of stuff. But it, it, it's amazing to me how you, you and your colleagues not, not only, you know, tested them, but also kind of took care of some of my technical inadequacies and my colleagues' technical inadequacies because you just rehabbed so well. And with this TAP program, which is now POTIF, and we, we can talk about that in a minute, but it's really helped take care of our warriors at the highest level. Yeah, I think a huge part of it was once we understood that you understood we trusted you guys because if I went to Balboa in whatever 1996 and said, "Hey, my my neck hurts, my shoulder hurts, my back hurts," they're going to put us on the protocol of, "Okay, well, you need six months off, and you need this and that." And we realized that you realized that we wanted to get back to work. And so when you told us, "Listen," when Jason would look at me and say, "Jocko, you cannot do pull-ups 
for three weeks. You cannot do pull-ups for three weeks. He'd, he'd like look at me and nod his head and say, nod your head and say, I understand, Jock. And I'd say, I understand, Jason. No pull-ups for three weeks because I had bursitis in my arm, right? Or whatever the case may be. There was a, a level of trust that we developed with you guys that when you told us to do something, we understood that, that you meant it and it was right. And also, to your point, when you told us, hey, here's the here's the rehab exercises that you need to do. And if you're going to do the desert or you're going to jungle warfare or whatever you're going to do right now, you can go, but you got to do these rehab exercises. We would do them. So we had a very good uh, mutually supporting relationship where you were telling us what to do. We trusted that you were going to allow us to do as much as we possibly could, but that was also a limit. And hey, you can't do this thing. But no, I really, really don't know. No, you can't do this thing. Okay, we trusted you guys. And that, that's what I think made the program so effective and makes it so effective to this day, just this incredible level of trust between both sides. Jocko, you, you nailed it. And I think it was incumbent upon my colleagues, someone like me, to be able to, to earn that trust. But I, I, have, I have a saying, everyone around you has someone to teach you. So, I'm sorry. Everyone around you has something to teach you. It's up to you to listen and learn. And I learn more from my physical therapy colleagues, my athletic therapy, uh, athletic trainers, physical therapy, uh, nutrition. Parsley's stuff was amazing with all the sleep and uh, hormonal looks. And uh, it was it was really great to put this together in its infancy and now it's you know just in a much 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 better space than we we even started but that's that's what started the culture shift for people like you and your colleagues to get better Mm -hmm. to work more on injury prevention and actually not view medical as something like we're gonna we're gonna take you out of the fight our goal is to get you back as soon as possible as strong as you can efficiently and safely yeah and there was another element of trust and that was if i showed up to medical there was something wrong like (laughs) like jason knew if i walked in there it wasn't like oh i had a little ding and maybe i was being a whiner no if i showed up there there was something that need i needed help i'm not coming in there to 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 miss work i'm not coming there because i want to get a limited duty uh shit from you guys no if a seal shows up to medical there's something wrong with them and they need help. You don't need to screen like, well, are you sure this really, no, 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 we're there because we're injured. That's what's going on. <laughs> so that that's also a very good place to start is that we're not looking for a way out. We're looking for a way in. Yeah. And and there's plenty of places in the, there's plenty of places in the military and in the world where what they're looking for is a way out. Like I want to get limited duty. I don't want to have to work. Right. The SEALs are not doing that. We want to work. <laughs> right. That's why we're in there. Fix us and get me back in the game. Right. We do. We deal with uh, you know plenty of injured folks that you know just may or may not want to go back to work, mm-hmm. and it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to dissect that out. There was absolutely no question down in Coronado what you all wanted to do. The, the other thing is I, I wanted to do is I, I wanted to learn more, and again back to that learning thing. And so you know, I went up to a lot of the uh, you know beginning of Hell Weeks, the the breakouts, and you know, I got. <laughs> Probably you at trade ed, like Roger, get out of there. There's a million tons of brass there. You're gonna slip. It's hot. It's like I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. And but it, it was really good to see, uh, you know, not just break out, but going out to the desert, going out to the island with you guys, being doing stuff with you and watching and learning was absolutely invaluable. You because put- I could see what the stresses were going through the shoulder, the knee, the mind, the body, and that, that helped us immensely understand. The, the reports that they came back with, I remember you guys put some kind of monitors on guys, like heart rate monitors, movement monitors, and the guys came back from our desert training. And it was like everyone was beside themselves in terms of the output, the movement, the stress level, the heart rate, it was all off the charts. It was like they had competed in, you know, world class competition, uh, triathlons with mixed in with the decathlon. You know, it was like yeah. strength, endurance, mental stress. It was all off the charts. Uh, it, it, it's crazy when you distilled down some of these numbers. And that's where it really started. Uh, 
the data movement is once we got the nuts and bolts in place, we had some really good people that we brought in to help us with the data and analytics. Again, all about to help you perform better, but you start looking at some of these numbers and it's like, you can go win the Tour de France tomorrow. <laughs> like the, the output, the watts, the climbs, the, I, it, it's crazy numbers and, and heart rates in the 30s and 40s and blood pressures that heart rate variability and all these things we, we start to look at in terms of how you recover, how you perform, fine-tune machines. Mm -hmm. It's really good. And so we had to be, we had to be even better. We had to find ways to be at, at our top game because we're already dealing with a pretty finely tuned human. How do we tune that person up even more? Especially, you know, as you said, you get on with six, 10th year, 15th year in the teams, there's nothing more than we want to do to, than to protect that human capital. Mm -hmm. So then how did this program roll into the, uh, the PFF, the protection of family, of the protection of force family? Yeah, so, so POTIF, and I, you know, I'm gonna probably get this all wrong, but this, it, it finally got enough legs through people like Captain Tom Chaby, mm -hmm. Admiral McRaven, who you know extremely well and worked with Chaby and, and others, even Admiral Eric Olson, mm -hmm. and saw the utility, I, I think, of what this program uh, was about. People like Master Chief Glenn Mercer, others that, that really started to look holistically at you know its strength, nutrition, conditioning, sleep, mental health, wellness, how to train, diet, etc. Learning how to take care of the body and, and these little injuries that would really keep the operators out of the more severe stuff. And so that's, I think, really how POTIF got born. And, you know, Chaby did an incredible job of, of helping shepherd this through. And to your mm -hmm. point, it, it took a while. <laughs> it took a lot of time. And, and in fact, when you, when you look at the family side, there was all the operational dollars are for active duty SEALs and direct active duty SEAL. But POTIF is preservation of the force and family mm -hmm. because they knew that it was important to also take care of your family while you were gone. And it was really critical to that. But from a funding standpoint, that hadn't been set up through Congress. And so you can put family in there, but there's no dollars. It, it ain't going to happen. Mm -hmm. So that, that took a little bit of, of time. But then the family became a really important piece to holistically allow the operator to be at their best. And, and there's a bunch of elements of, of POTIF, which we can talk about, but they're, they're really basically the, the essence of, of what was started with TAP, but is now just so to the next level. And I, I want to congratulate you know everyone who's just done an amazing job with this program. Yeah, uh, I think Chavy was like a national level mogul skier. Yeah, he was. And he, he and his, both of his knees were annihilated. This is before he joined the Navy. So he had to go through buds with just annihilated knees. And this is not uncommon. It's not uncommon for guys that obviously guys are going in the SEAL teams. They were in sports growing up and they already come with pre existing issues, which I was lucky enough. I was like, you know, young and just just healed. I mean, I was just good. Warrior but, blood. Uh, yeah. Wolverine, Wolverine blood. Get some. <laughs> but a lot of guys show up with already pre existing injuries. That's a problem. So, so this thing with the, with the protection of the force and family, so now all of a sudden we can bring the wife in to, she's getting knee surgery, we're gonna help her heal up. It's that type of thing, right? Yeah, that, that's exactly right, is you wanna integrate you know, the, the, the families into the units, integrate them in the installations, the communities. Uh, there's a concept with POTIF to build not just resilient operators, but resilient families, and that was, something that would be able to withstand the the op tempo that was just massive for you all I and mean, you were in and out all the time mm -hmm. and you know to the point where your adrenal axis when you came back thanks to parsley and others doing just you know magician level work to be able to help us discern that and put that together and, and really take the whole program to the next level and, and lastly I think setting up a, a connection with the families and again this is you know I'm way over my skis here not my not my expertise my ski tips here is not my expertise but understanding the whole thing and being conversant about it and sort of my my role down there to, to understand and be a be a part of it my role down in Coronado was to to have the knowledge so that we could talk about it when an operator came in and said hey how's your family how you doing 
how's everything going? Like, so-and-so may not ask about that, but you know, as doc, I can get away with that. And I knew that, and I knew that you would do better. We got a great story. One of my uh, team guys that operated on, and you know, this is a credit to the whole program, but you know, it's, I told you how well you all rehabbed and fix a shoulder, labrum tear, dislocated. How long have you been dislocating your shoulder? I don't know, three years. Okay, you've been dealing with it. How, how many times you dislocated? 125, I don't know, lost count, 500 times. I mean, it's literally like hundreds of times. You're like, the, the amount of uh, resiliency, you know, that, that the operators demonstrate never ceased to amaze me. It was, it was, it was off the chart. And, and this is a very typical story. Well, I just lived with it. I had to deploy. I had to go do my job. I had to go be there. I had to be there for my team, my platoon, my whatever. I'm like... I get it. But he's like, listen, this is the last, I, I can't, it's just coming out too much. It comes out when I look the wrong way. It comes out in my sleep. It comes out, I'm like, I got to get it fixed. You fix a shoulder, thought we do a great job, you know, high five and classic out of the OR, whatever you do. And we, we get out of the OR and, you know, all of a sudden I get a call from down in Coronado. It's, you know, four or five, six weeks. I'm like, oh man, he's just not making progress. Really stiff. It's not working out right. Senior chief so and so, and I'm like, oh man, this is this is a bummer. Um, should be doing better. Okay, well, I'll be down tomorrow. You know, and come in the training room and see see with the Jason and I'm like, what is going on here? And again and again and again, we just kept working. We kept doing the therapy, doing all the right things. It wasn't from lack of trying, from lack of being there, from lack of doing the right exercises. And then I I talked to Parsley, and I'm like, dude, Parsley, what's going on? Any ideas about this guy? You know, we're just having a little bit of trouble. You know, so we would we would talk about mm -hmm. you guys behind your back. You know, with doctor to doctor, <laughs> you know, we could because we're taking care of you. And he's like, oh, let me let me run some stuff. So it does labs and basically does a bunch of labs. And Parsley's lab, thing, you know, no tons of them. He's got like, you know, a ten page report or something mm -hmm. crazy. I look at the thing. And there's like undetectable testosterone. Ooh. Adrenal axis is all jacked. Uh, there's, you know, a bunch of these other parameters and thyroid hormone and all these other things just completely way off for someone who's 37 years old. Mm -hmm. So he's like, let me look into this. So I'm like, okay. Three, four weeks later, Parsley works his magic and his shoulders like healed. It's like your biceps. It's mm -hmm. magic. It's just <laughs> fixed. And he's like, so the whole that really got a big wake up call mm -hmm. for us. If I, with my hammer and nail, just focus on the shoulder, I'm gonna get it wrong. I'm gonna get it wrong for my patients now. I'm gonna get it wrong for you and your colleagues. And so that's where we really have to take this holistic approach, understand our patients, and use the resources and the team around you. It's a team, and you need teamwork to be able to execute this at the highest level. How complicated is the shoulder? When it's, when it's <laughs> jacked up. There there was no lack of challenge that you guys uh, gave to me and my teammates and colleagues at Balboa based on how jacked up some of these shoulders were. You know, injuries that were in your 30s that we don't see to 50 or 60, like mm -hmm. completely torn rotator cuff, arthritis in the shoulder off the chart. Well, it doesn't really hurt that much. I have no idea how this thing doesn't hurt. It doesn't, I can do whatever I want. I can, I can do jujitsu. I can be a sniper. I can do all these other things without any difficulty. And it, it really amazed me the level of injuries that uh, some of your colleagues would present with. Uh, but it really just demonstrated toughness. I think resiliency and focus on on their job and the mission. And and. It would only come in if it was really bad. <laughs> That's at the end of the day, I figured out. Mm -hmm. The shoulder, though, as a joint, like yeah. when somebody injures it, can you get it back? How, how close can you get it back to being good to go, 100%? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, Jocko. So we have a bunch of specialties in orthopedics, and, and you do your five years of orthopedic training. You get done with Balboa. And then you can do a fellowship. Not everyone does a fellowship, but a fellowship is generally one extra year of training. And you can just do a foot and ankle fellowship. And then you become kind of a foot and ankle surgeon. You can just do a hand, wrist, kind of elbow fellowship. And that's some pretty complex stuff. And the hand, wrist, elbow is a lot of bones, a lot of tendons, a lot of ligaments. I mean, there's books bigger than your bookshelf here <laughs> just on hand surgery in, in orthopedics. Uh, I do mostly shoulder, knee, sports surgery, which is... It usually goes together. Sometimes we add hip surgery or hip scopes into that as well. And then we also have joint replacement surgeons that just 
really focus on taking care of arthritis, so that usually the hip and knee. We have people that just do spine surgery mm-hmm. and neck and back and lower back surgery. And so with me in, in the shoulder knee, I really like the shoulder, again, back to my engineering mind, because it, it is a little bit of a complex joint. But every every specialty in orthopedics sort of has their, their, their niche, their tough parts that you treat and take care of. But for me, the shoulder was just super fascinating. It, it, it's a joint that is quite mobile. It's designed to be very mobile. It's designed to be moved around. It's designed to be held in by a gazillion different muscles around the shoulder girdle from your back and your scapula with a lot of complex interactions of, of ligaments, muscles, and, and bones. And so for me, the shoulder is was always something I, I, I wanted to study and, and was very passionate about. When you open that thing up, do you do you know that do you like how many how many shoulders have you opened up? Uh, thousands, thousands. Yeah. So you when you open that thing up, it's just it's you know exactly what's going on or not you know exactly what's but you can figure it out. You're looking at it like oh this is a little high, this thing's a little rough, this thing's a little ruptured. Like that's what it looks like to you. It, it is, yeah. And but it's it, it's what we train and what we train to do is. No different than the, what you did. It's it's discipline. It's following a process. It, it's uh, knowledge. Um, anatomic knowledge is surgical power. Pathologic knowledge, understanding the MRI is is surgical power to be able to take care of your shoulder or knee or whatever injury efficiently and, and safely, and to make sure that all the pathology is corrected back to normal as good as possible. It might not be able to be perfectly corrected, but we try to get it back as normal as possible. And we got a lot of trinkets to be able to do that and implants and other, other things. So it, it's a really, it's a really fun job to be able to put this stuff, to, to put it together. And I, like I said back you know earlier in, in the podcast, was I like using my hands. And I like being able to use that on patients to, to help them get better and get back to, Get back to enjoying life and living life. Are they or do you use robotics now to do any of this stuff? We Is do. It? Yeah, it's amazing. It's a, it's an exploding field in in terms of replacing the the hip, the knee, uh, the robots helping you uh, really do it. I, I do some partial knee replacements mm-hmm. in which we do uh, robotics, and it really helps understand the the exact angle and the femur versus the tibia at the knee, and what those angles are, and how you how you integrate that and put the right implant and the right size of implant. I mean, you, we have a gazillion modular combinations of implants these days and the ability to do, you know, what I call precision medicine, precision surgery and understand your exact bony configuration, which is different than Echo Charles, is, is really important to get to get the right outcome. We're still early. Uh, there's stuff out there that say robots might not be better than a very well-trained human. And, mm-hmm. you know, we might see that in, in your world. But I, I, I think we're getting there. What we do know is that just like everything, planning matters. And we're doing a lot of planning in the shoulder and the shoulder world. I, you know, I would do, you know, a shoulder like yours, Jocko, I would have on the computer and basically almost be able to, depending on what type of surgery you're doing, be able to do your surgery ahead of time mm-hmm. on the computer, manipulate things, change implants, do this, do that, and really execute the whole thing ahead of time. Would that be based on the 3D image of my actual shoulder and what's in there for that's, real? That's correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Your exact image, your exact MRI scan or CT scan. And we would know exactly every, we'd know, I tell my patient, we know every nook and cranny about your shoulder way more than you want to know. I'm happy to show it to you. Mm-hmm. Here's what we're going to do. Here's the plan. And this is how we're going to execute it. And this is what we, this is what we plan to do. The, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit just in comparison, but you know, you have, you end up working for the new England Patriots, you know, with the NFL that the interesting thing or the tough thing is like you got a seal, he's on deployment, he hurts his shoulder. He's not going to a doctor. Like he's gonna he's gonna use that thing for the next four months or five months or three months until he gets home from deployment. The pro athlete, they're they're getting the opportunity to like completely uh, uh, baby that thing. Th- that's now look, I know if it's the Super Bowl or a playoff game, you're going to get that guy in that game, right? No one misses the Super Bowl. <laughs> That's the way it's going. <laughs> I mean, unless you're, I mean, unless you had surgery, right? No one misses. The you're going to be in the game. You're in the game. Yeah. 
So there is some similarities from that perspective that you're going to get this guy to play that next game. Yeah, they do. It, it's uh, it, it's interesting. When, when I went to the when I went to the NFL and um, you know Belichick, Robert Kraft, Jonathan Kraft interviewed me to for the job, and I really didn't. didn't want the job per se I, I was like okay well you know i got enough going on i moved to mass general i just moved my whole family across country out of i don't talk about culture shock out of coronado to you know boston area and it's hot and humid again and <laughs> it's like what do we what do we just do here um but it's a great boston's a great town uh the crafts are incredible human beings uh, Belichick is is a great leader. He's very disciplined. He's very organized. I'm convinced he has a photographic memory. He's he's brilliant. And what they were really interested in was what what we had built with the SEAL teams. What mm-hmm. we had done as a, as a team there, and how we had worked together. And and we they had a number of the elements in in this team and a lot of the NFL teams and other pro teams, baseball, hockey, you name it, soccer, had this stuff, but it was, it was still a little bit early. And we, we, we helped integrate quite a bit uh, and, and augment their program with a lot of the things we had, what I called battle tested mm-hmm. in the SEAL teams and what wearables, like if Jock was gonna have a wearable, it's gonna work. <laughs> And otherwise, he ain't wearing it. Mm-hmm. And so I know those wearables that the team guys would use. And mm-hmm. so, okay, well, if a player wants to use it and they have to agree to it, there's all kinds of rules with the NFLPA, the Players Association, and things you can and can't do in, in terms of mandating and testing and use of wearables and stuff like that. So, But at the end of the day, I wanted to deliver precision medicine to every player. So just like with the teams, they could optimize themselves and perform it at the best. Give them the information. Here's where you're at. Here's where your sleep's at. Here's where your nutrition's at. Here's a 20-page lab report. We're going to sit down with our super smart uh, nutritionist, Ted, and you know our head athletic uh, trainer, Jim Whalen, and you're going to sit down and, and work through this stuff and truly understand how to optimize your body. Oh, did you even know you had a lactose intolerance? Uh, no, but I, well, we're going to help you with that. And three to six weeks later, the player feels <laughs> immensely better. Just super simple things that we were able to identify and bring with a lot of nutrition, a lot of sleep hygiene, wearable technology, uh, tracking sensors in, in performance and in play. All of this was stuff we had already done with the teams. Mm-hmm. And the SEAL teams had his, and so bringing that to you know bringing that to the NFL uh, and, and the Patriots was was really really pretty cool. And again, they, they had a lot of it. It was just kind of fine tuning, augmenting, but really saying, look, if this is going to work in a SEAL, I, there's a good chance this might work in the NFL player, and that's that stood pretty well. And and you know just to back up, Belichick was you know down in Annapolis, you know <laughs> Naval Academy didn't didn't go there for for college, but you know, knew it quite well. So we, we had a very good relationship being, you know, his huge support for the Navy and you know, the crafts are you know, wonderful, wonderful humans that are also, you know, hugely supportive of, of the military. And, you know, in fact, I, they would ask me routinely because they would always recognize a service member. And I brought and recommended a few people I had operated on, you know, including a, a Marine who had not just one Purple Heart, but two Purple Hearts. When he was about ready to get, you know, tossed out of the tossed out of the military, you're able to tune up his knee, operate on it, fix it. But you know, he was recognized at one of the Patriots games. So, just trying trying to give back and give back to the community, I, I think, is what it was all about. What's the uh, comparison between an NFL player and a T and a SEAL? They're they're similar. Mm-hmm. Uh, we um, the the drive to get better, the drive to optimize yourself, the drive to do the job, all, all of that's there. It, the resiliency, the mental toughness, the um, if you're getting at the top, you know, any, any level, you know, not just the top level, you're doing things right. And it's, it, it's a similar mindset at the professional athlete level. You're, you're, you're doing things that most other people aren't. When I see the like shows about Tom Brady, is there anyone more focused on that than that guy on like his performance? 
Tommy's the best, and he's focused incredibly well on winning Super Bowl. He that's every year. That's mm-hmm. what he wants to do, and he's he's the best and a a, a great person, a great leader. Um, cares a ton. I, I learned I learned a lot from Tommy. It seems like there's nothing else in his head besides <laughs> this game. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, I mean it's it's uber focus. It, mm. it, it's amazing, and you know, but but all these guys, and you know, when he's thrown to whoever, you know, Gronk, Edelman, you name it, they, it's that same, it's that same uber focused mindset. And there's a little bit of just almost. It depends how you every player internalizes or doesn't internalize it, but it's it's you're amped. I mean, you're ready to go on the mission. You're ready to go. Like it's go time, and it's it's really cool to see that that comparison between you know the, the seal teams and the pro athletes like it's go time and and you're ready yeah the weird thing about the seal teams is the game is so varied yeah. you know the, yeah. the missions are so different and you got to be ready to kind of do all of them and so you don't get to just have this one singular focus in your brain you've got to have you just can't you have to be able to do a bunch of different things so it's a little bit harder to prepare for you can't just be a uh, one Trick pony. I'm not saying Tom Brady's a one trick pony. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but I'm saying he got to he got one game to play. Yeah. You know, he had to yeah. throw that damn ball, right? Yeah. That's what he had to do. And, you know, in the SEAL teams you've got to throw the damn grenade, but you've also got to climb the ladder. You've also got to shoot the rifle. You've also got to carry the rucksack. You've also got to buddy carry your friend. You've also got a low crawl across the field. You got all these different things. There's a lot of stuff you gotta be generally prepared for. No offense, Tom Brady. Respect. <laughs> um you, you talked about Belichick's leadership, right? How's that leadership in the, when, you, when you're the lead surgeon, leadership in, in the medical world, what's that like? It's important. You know, you're the, you're, you're the leader every day. You're the leader of the, the clinic, the operating room, but you got an incredible cast around you to help execute on the, the, the plan of the day. And that's doing clinic, taking super high-end care of your, Patients going to the operating room, uh, you know, lead, leading a, a a great environment there, and you know, it can be a stressful environment. You can get into trouble. You can, you know, bend there. I can knock on wood, nick someone's vessel, you know, and bleeding, and all of a sudden, the entire shoulder wound you just talk about is now full of red, bright blood. And you're like, what do you do next? What's the next plan? What do you do? How do you get out of this? And that's a real deal because it doesn't take long before the rest of the vascular volume is depleted and then things can happen really quickly. So having the ability to be level-headed, to be cool, to be calm, to follow the process, to have your plan set in place, B, C, D, and E, down the road in case things happen, to take a deep breath. I, I was... In the operating room, and I just talked about that. I had a vessel, and all of a sudden, the blood was in the wound, and all of a sudden, he can't see anything through this six-inch incision because it's literally full of about five cups of red blood. And you're like, okay, what do you do? You get just like anything, direct pressure. Again, put your finger on it, put a, a pad on it, go to a lap pad, get the pressure on it. How do you handle that? How do you have that cool, calm, collectiveness to be able to do that? You know, you could really... It, it, it could decompensate really quickly, but I got to thank the Naval Academy, the constant yelling out back, the constant, what are you going to do? You know, it, it was always that that, you know, helped me. And believe me, I'm not perfect at it. And I've had some really great people that have taught me how to do this. But the first thing I did, okay, get the direct pressure, take immediate care of it. We're going to be okay. We got a few seconds. Turn around, talk to the perioperative nurse, talk to the scrub technician, Say, here's what we got. We got into a little bit of bleeding. We got direct pressure on it. This is what we're going to do. Can you please get so-and-so? Can you please alert the uh, general vascular surgeon? Can you please also get two units of red blood cells from the anesthesiologist? Uh, Can you please get this gel foam and thrombin, which is a special clotting agent that you can put into the wound? And then you get back to work. But that 10, 15 seconds is so valuable. Mm to be able to reset the team rather than just diving right in. You, you got 10, 15 seconds, at least in our world. Mm-hmm. You, you went up with 10, 15 seconds to be able to just take a step back, 
breathe, and then get the process fully defined. The discipline, standard operating procedures. Take a step back, that's what we're doing. Exactly. Hey, what do you think about, um, with going back to football again, what do you think about, what's it look like from the inside when they start talking about the CTE and the brain trauma and all that stuff? What's the what's the feeling inside that world right now? Yeah, it's it's the it, it's the real deal, and it's definitely um, not only conversation, but to the point where uh, there's a ton of research. You know, from the medical side, there's a ton of uh, NFL sponsored grants for all kinds of concussion studies, CTE. How do we prevent this? How do we make it better? And I can tell you from, you know, I was there from 13-ish to 16 in the NFL. It's it's way better even now in terms of what we have for uh, athletic trainer spotters. We have n- two neurologists unaffiliated with the league on the sideline and or neurosurgeons. We have brain health experts. We have a mindset that's there, at least talking to my colleagues that are in the league full-time still is, Brain health is super important, and we need to be able to make sure we're taking care of the players at the highest level and, and making the right return-to-play decisions or not return-to-play decisions and making that with independent neurologic consultants that truly know neurology. I was having to make that call, mm-hmm. and believe me, I'm not the best person to make that call mm-hmm. as a orthopedic surgeon. I, I I know enough of it we do. We do these, you know, scat tests. These we just barely had these iPad things going. We do it on paper in the locker room, and you know, do these basic uh, verbal, three verbal questions that the players would, you know, memorize and count from <laughs> sevens. And you know, what day is it? And where are you? And you know, they would all memorize them. They yeah. knew they knew the whole thing. Why? Because they wanted to play. not only did Jocko want to play, the NFL player wanted to play. They they wanted they wanted to stay in the game. But they're also becoming the, the player is also becoming much more cognizant of their their brain health too and and they know when they know when the self policing is really important Mm -hmm. and and the team policing is really important and so i think that's the biggest mindset and culture change we the nfl is is taking it super seriously i applaud them for it and I, i congratulate all the great research and science that's going on with this and let's face it the military can also is learning along the side side and there's a lot of DOD research out there obviously from blast wounds that are way higher in intensity um, and, and collaborating with the DOD among many other in institutions and, and government entities out there is going to help us I think get this problem nearly solved. Mm-hmm. Did you work at the Red Sox or the Bruins when you were up there? Yeah, we did. We did, Jock. Well, I, I wasn't the, the head doc, but was the assistant doc. We'd, we'd cover, I don't know, eight or ten games and share the 81 home games that we had to, to cover when we were in the playoffs and maybe a week of uh, spring training. Um, and, uh, you know, similar for the Bruins, doing six, eight teams. But, but I, had a, I had a great team in, in Boston that really did a good job of taking care of the teams. But, that, I mean, that was just taking care of the teams, full-time job on top of being an orthopedic surgeon, on top of uh, running the, the sports division and research and running a fellowship and training everyone. It was, it was, <laughs> it, it was a lot. I didn't have any uh, – didn't, didn't have much – solo time if you will <laughs> and was Johnny Kim up with you at this time he was yeah so what a, what an amazing individual uh, that, that's another time I remember so when he was applying to become an <laughs> officer you and I sat on his board uh, and rev- did his officer interview board to write him in a recommendation to go and become an officer and uh, and I remember I he wanted to become a doctor and I remember saying you know I'm sitting in the room with you and I forget who the other person was but I yeah. I'm sitting here saying I don't know why you want to become a doctor I'd never want to be a doctor I don't like hospitals I don't like doctors I don't like nurses I don't like medicine <laughs> and then I said but if if there was anybody I wanted to take care of my kids it'd be you Johnny and we gave him a, a str- the best recommendation we possibly could but uh, d- did you remember him from that time frame as well because he's a corpsman he's a medic. Yeah, no, he's, I remember Johnny extremely well. And another one was my partner, Dan Solomon, who was uh, probably there. And, you know, I apologize if we forget exactly who wasn't on that board. But certainly that was, that, that was very interesting. <laughs> I mean, with you on that. And we, uh, 
you know, Johnny Johnny went full bore, but he would hang out with uh, one of my other sports colleagues, Dan Saul and myself, called to Balboa. We published research papers together. We, I'd come to the operating room, come to clinic, you know, just just like what had been done with me. I, you know, he wanted to go into medicine, and I uh, applauded him for it. And he had to go back and uh, use some of his GI Bill and go to like San Diego State and take classes and do all these other things. And, and um, what an incredible story with your podcast with him and incredibly proud of he and, and what he's done and, and who he represents because he also visited with me in Boston because he was at, at medical school he was a medical school at Harvard and so he would come and you know, just kind of randomly show up in my clinic which was right in downtown Boston on uh, Charles Ave and pretty pretty cool spots so he, he would show up and it, w- it was a nice uh, it was it was it was really nice to see him there to have the connection after uh, what he had done with the SEAL teams. But then next level now NASA astronaut. I mean, just amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's Johnny. And when you talk to him, he's still the same Johnny. He's still just what you know. You know, do you need help with anything? What can I do? Like just yeah. humble and awesome as always. So so one of the stories I told Johnny Jocko was um, about. Balboa again because he was asked he was asked about the Patriots and everything else I said listen it was uh, it was during our Super Bowl run when the Patriots um, ended up beating the Seattle Seahawks in the Super Bowl and and it was sometime in October before that Super Bowl and Belichick comes finds me he's like Roger Doc here's what we got we're going to Green Bay in November after Thanksgiving, it's gonna be cold. I'm just telling you. You've been in Green Bay for a game. It's just cold. Okay, here's the deal. Blah, blah, blah. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go to San Diego after Green Bay. We're not coming back to Boston. We're gonna go to San Diego. We're playing the Chargers in San Diego. You know, still the stadium here before the San Diego Chargers moved up to L.A. What can we do in San Diego, Doc? That is not the bleepin' bleepin' Sea World, not the zoo, not that. That's what college teams do. We're pro team. But what can we do in San Diego? I need like an afternoon diversion for these guys. All 53 active players, plus 10 on the practice squad, plus all the coaches. I mean, it's like five buses worth of people because you know, every player gets their own <laughs> row, basically. It's, I, I said, Coach, let's go visit Balboa. Let's go visit our wounded warriors. And so in first week of December 2013, we had it all set up with Balboa. And I don't know, maybe it's been done before, but you know, certainly some people have called me and talked to me about it. But all 53 players, all 10 practice squad, all coaches after practice that day at USD, University of San Diego, in the mid-late morning, head over to Balboa for about two hours. And we had it set up so they knew sort of what state the player was from and so or what college they went to and played football. And so you went to Wounded Warriors rooms as part of C5 where you were from that state. So there was at least some state-to-state connection. And I was walking around, and you know, Brady was kind of <laughs> sequestered in one area of of the courtyard, and everyone was coming in trying to get autographs, hang out with him. But the rest of the team, and you know, Brady went out and saw a ton of the other wounded warriors as well. Don't want to <laughs> say he didn't do not do it; he was super busy that in that visit. But the entire teams there, all five buses. You know, usually you get like maybe you know three or four or five to go visit. Mm-hmm. You know. The, cancer or children's hospital or something you know something really good that the community gives back from the nfl but this was the entire organization everyone and the reporters and i'm standing there in the courtyard or waiting to load the buses up these guys are getting hungry because they uh, you know consume a lot and uh, burn a lot of calories obviously so we're getting ready to go back to the hotel and um in Del Mar, we were standing on the racetrack at one of the hotels up there, and um, I see, you know, like Vince Wilfork and Edelman and, you know, some of these really respected players and names just get on the bus, and, and tears are streaming down their face, and I, it was a very um, 
interesting, almost emotional. Uh, when we went back to the hotel dinner and was asking, you know, Julian Edelman and Vince and some of these other guys and Gronk, I was like, how was that? And they're like, dog, it was just incredibly moving. I've got a wounded warrior guy with one arm, uh, an elbow on the other side, no legs, telling me to go kick some ass on Sunday and motivating me more than I was motivating them. They were like, I'm supposed to be coming in motivating these guys. And it just was so, it was so touching. And you never, you never get praise from <laughs> Belichick. Well, you get it indirectly. And he came up and was just very thankful. And um, it, it, it was very meaningful. It, it, it meant something. Yeah, I can imagine that. Like I was talking earlier about how there's a disconnect. You know, the country's at war and yet the, most of the country's not at war. And here you introduced these guys and showed what kind of sacrifices are being made. And, uh, you know, these guys are an even more extreme example, you know. Yeah, I was talking about you living in Coronado, and that's a nice place to live, but these guys are, you know, multimillionaire people that play a game with a ball for a living and get paid millions of dollars to do it. And they see the sacrifices that are made by these, these young warriors that, you know, like you said, quadruple amputee. I mean, who's still telling people to get fired up and, hey, go kick ass today. That's just, that's the kind of thing where you, they, they realize what kind of sacrifices are being made for them to be able to do their job and live their life. It's, I, I, can, I can only imagine what it must have felt like for them to see these, to see these young wounded warriors. That's, um, that's heavy, for sure. Yeah, yeah, it was. Did you, did you as your working this kind of stuff you know nsw and 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 the nfl and stuff i know you talk about a lot about data and collecting data and then utilizing data well tell me a little bit more about that yeah so i mean this this was really born out of you know coronado and uh, what some smart people were doing there but we, we had to we had to put it together we you can collect all kinds of numbers and data and how Jocko sleeps every night and what your sleep score is and your adrenal access and uh, how your Y balance score is and force plate analysis and you know, all, all these great things, but you gotta be able to interpret it. Cause you're, I mean, I'm already gave you like a million data points right. just in one day. What are you going to do with that? So we, we really started working hard on in, interpreting the data and be able to start really in its in, in the infancy, starting to use almost uh, AI and, and machine learning, artificial intelligence in a way. And, you know, super hot topic now, but we, you know, we were way ahead of the curve in terms of putting this stuff together and really analyzing it in a statistical way so that, number one, we could get the operators the right resources. We knew where they the ROI was going to be. We knew what resources the operators were using. And we knew precision medicine. Jocko is different than your master chief at Trade It. Mm -hmm. Much different body, as you described, and much different requirements and much different biceps. So we would look at that and, and really try to say, okay, this is now what a specific type of person, breacher or sniper, and what those differences are, and start looking at it from even a job standpoint. So this was really unique stuff back in the day to be able to help a sniper do better, a breacher do better, but they're not the same person for the most part, right? And, the, and we could help that person optimize, optimize their craft. When I went to the Patriots, I quickly learned, you know, that old, although Belichick was, was brilliant in photographic memory, he was not going to learn medical speak. So I had to learn coach speak. <laughs> so just like, you know, like I had to learn what a breacher did because I saw it and went out and you know, went to the desert and saw what you do with breacher. And I, I could understand it better what the mechanics of that were and what the shoulder, and what the knee was doing and the hip and the back and the stresses across the body. I, I did the same thing in the NFL and I wanted to be able to look at how to discern the medical information we had that was on our team and provide that back in coach speak. So it's pretty basic. You play fantasy football, you do football, it's uh, catches, it's yards, it's uh, snap percentage, how many 
if you're a running back and you do this many snaps, usually how is your snap percentage for three downs? Are you playing all three of those downs? Are they taking you out because they're managing load or because you got an injury or other things? And so that's where we really started to dissect this down, Jocko, is how do the, the stats help a team understand their team, their position better, like a slot receiver like Edelman versus center or lineman like Vince Wolfork. Two totally different bodies, totally different person, but different stats to follow. But sometimes they can have the same knee injury. So how do you interpret that same knee injury, that same ankle sprain, that same uh, high ankle sprain, the low ankle sprain, the knee sprain, the meniscus, the hamstrings, a really tough problem. How does that behave differently for someone who's on the offensive line or someone who's a slot receiver, someone who's a quarterback, someone who's a cornerback? So that's what we really started to discern is really taking a, a – personalized but also specific position approach to the data so that I could deliver Bill and the team better information. Take it what they want with it. You know, it's like me saying, okay, uh, Jocko, you're not going on deployment. Well, it's too bad he already left. <laughs> it's here's the here's the information. But it actually really helped from helping predict performance. And now it's now we're to the point where we're doing this on the outside. Uh, of the NFL and doing a bunch of predictability models as well. Did you make a lot of money off of fantasy football during this time period? <laughs> so it's it, it's interesting. I we, we have a rule where you you cannot um, bet do fantasy. And in fact, my kids all wanted me to be in a fantasy league. Like, Dad, you got me in a fantasy league. You know, you know what's going on. You know what's got for you know you know what's going on with Gronk's knee. You know, what's, uh, I'm like I can't, and neither can any of my team. But speaking of team, you know, for the for the Patriots, we had. And we, we built it up quite a bit, but we had almost 75 people that were just part of the medical team. Whew. Many of those full-time, a lot part-time. But you know, I guess it, it's taking care of the family. It's just like POTIF. You've got ob Gun, You've got a dermatologist. You've got a dentist. You've got pediatricians. You've got family practice docs, sports medicine. You, you've got everything. And so it sort of falls under... The head team physician purview plus the head athletic trainer and I mentioned before but Jim Whalen you know the guy's incredible to be able to organize this whole medical system for the players and their families it, it, it's really impressive how much of a beast is Gronk <laughs> like as a physical human yeah, specimen like, was that guy just yeah. a mutant he's Jocko he's one of a kind it's amazing I mean I've never seen anything like it he is he is a mutant. Yeah, it's, it's like they should call him this dude, right? Yeah, <laughs> just like let's reproduce this dude and give put him yeah. make thousands, hundreds of thousands, and put him in the military. Unstoppable. Unstoppable. Yeah, that's, that's probably part of his name. And he seems like a, such a nice guy oh, too. Oh, he's the best. Gronk is the best. He's one of a kind. He's just he, he's amazing. But yeah, he is he is a beast. You did you do the work on him? Uh, no, took care of him. Took care of him after. Yeah. When we start talking about recovering from surgery like what's the biology around that what's the best way when people are recovering what do you got to do yeah so so it depends i mean say you tear your acl you know, tear a ligament in the knee we need to get that ligament to heal we, it's reconstructed you gotta get that ligament to heal so there's a, a biologic healing response and then also a physiologic response. And that physiologic response is, you know, what you're working on every day, you know, in, in the gym, and working on your, your squats, your hamstrings, your core, your uh, all, all the other uh, muscle groups that, that we really work on and, and try to get super creative in terms of our exercises. But we also have to balance that with the biology because you can go out right away at four to six weeks after an ACL reconstruction. But guess what? That ligament has not undergone what we call ligamentization or the ability to even heal into the bone because that ligament has to heal bone to bone, both, both in the femur and the tibia. That's where the ACL connects. And so if you rush biology, and by the way, if we could find a way to <laughs> improve the efficiency of biology and to get people's muscles back, we could really make an impact on some of these longer recoveries. But we're looking at this from a very holistic Standpoint, you know, and so that's why we want to optimize their nutrition, their sleep, their recovery time, their musculoskeletal program, the, the core. You know, if you just, well, your quads are too weak, your quads are too weak after ACL. Well, that's just not it. You I need your hamstring, I need your core, I need your back, I need your uh, abdominal muscles, lower extremity, your, your calf, your perineal muscles. 
we need everything, that whole kinetic chain, as we say, to function better before you go back. And that, that's, why, that's why I love this job is you have, you know, the ability to not only fix the knee, but then help coach that patient back to a successful outcome. Mm-hmm. Did you do Seth Stone surgery on his knee? I did. Seth's amazing. Yeah, he had a he had a, and I wish he was still with us, Jock. I know he's a great friend of yours, and uh, I miss him. And uh, a great great individual. He had very bad knee dislocation, multi leg knee, and we um, with that sometimes we have to do not just one surgery but two surgeries because sometimes there's four main ligaments of the knee: the ACL, the mm-hmm. PCL, the MCL, and the LCL. It's all around the knee. On top of other structures, your meniscus, your capsule, your cartilage, and he, he dinged a number of them. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he did it really, he did it really uh, well, that landing. And um, so anyway, we reconstructed it in two s- surgeries mm-hmm. staged about six, eight weeks apart. But the you know, great news is he was able to, you know, again, do what I talked about, <laughs> take take care of my technical inadequacies and, and rehab beyond and do do an incredible job and get back to his craft. I was uh, went down. He was doing rehab there in the clinic, and I went down. And whatever he was doing was hurting really bad. Um, like he's trying to bend it to a certain angle, right? This is you know you've got to make it to a certain angle. There was some kind of a device that was measuring the angle that he was bending his knee to for the first time, and he's pushing past to try and get a little bit more. And he's. It's a machine that's doing it, if I remember correctly. There's a literal machine that's moving his leg for him. Am I right? That's right, yeah. It's a CPM, passive motion machine. Yeah. Yeah, it puts you through the paces. So he's in that thing. Yep. And I come down, and he's in absolute agony, which is making me laugh hysterically. <laughs> so I'm standing next to him, and I'm waiting for the machine to go and push his leg again, and I'm laughing, and I finally get out my phone and start recording him as I'm laughing. So now he's... In absolute agony, but he's also laughing because I'm laughing at him. So he's got this <laughs> look on his face of, you know, I'm in a, I'm in absolute agony right now, and this is hilarious. And uh, but yeah, you know, he was able to heal up, but it's a long, yeah. it's a oh, long process, it's a long road. And yeah, you're you're describing exactly what you know that type of injury he had, and that's what we all worry about is you know orthopedic sports knee knee surgeons is. Stiffness, mm-hmm. loss of motion. You can't get your motion back. Guess what? You don't have the muscle excursion. Your quad doesn't work as well. Your hamstring doesn't work as well. So I, I don't, you know, care how much you work it and how many leg presses. But if you don't get the joint mobility back, mm-hmm. you can't optimize your muscle groups. And so it, it's it's a really tricky balance. And we're always trying to get people back as efficiently and quickly as we can but you know that <laughs> they, whatever he was doing in there worked and I, I appreciate him you know gritting and bearing through it and I'd love to see that video but he's <laughs> that but to be able to do that that's that, that's the only reason he was able to get back and, and, and do his craft you've got to do the PT correctly for sure yeah can't blow it off so as you're as you're I mean with all the knowledge that you've got everything you gained from the teams what kind of daily protocol are you doing to stay healthy to stay fit like what do you do yeah and, and, and Jocko I've, I've always tried to be good about this I mean I, I have to admit even back in the day I, pr- I almost got a little burnt out from you know all the rowing and the US national team kind of training stuff that was in and out of that circuit and you know so I wouldn't if I saw an erg I saw one here I was like <laughs> I get PTSD. The, the PTSD I get the shakes I'm like but I, I've gotten through that and so that was a big that was a big thing but um, with, with our with our life, sometimes, especially you know, in the healthcare, and I, I've taken care of a lot of colleagues, and there's you know, there's no greater honor than not only operating on you know a SEAL team, but also uh, other orthopedic surgery surgeon colleagues or other professional medical professional colleagues. And you know, I love you know, love taking care of you know all all walks of life. From you know, we do a ton of pro athletes to college to the other docs, but. I always find myself telling them, and it's really probably me telling myself when I'm talking out loud, is, look, you've taken care of people your entire life. You're now 58. You've got a bad rotator cuff tear. Well, but I got to get back. But I'm like, listen, take a little bit of time. Take care of yourself first, and then everything else will follow, and you'll be able to take better care of your patients. And so I've tried to 
follow more and more of that. I wasn't always the best at it, to be honest, because we get so busy. We get so busy with our life. We're also teaching. We're traveling. We're uh, teaching residents, taking care of our patients, teaching fellows. It's it, it's a it's a busy life. It's extremely rewarding. But I you know I got to tell you you you've helped in, inspire me among others to make sure that I'm taking care of myself and and I use that all the time and I think about you a lot. I take your supplements. I use the stuff. I like it a lot. Um, all natural and you know it's 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 amazing stuff and. I, I, I feel better on them, but it's also helping me do my routine better. And my most predictable time, just like you, just like your watch at 4.30 is, I'm up about 5, 5.15, 5.30. I go to the gym. I've also crafted my schedule so that I can do that and push some start times back by 15, 20 minutes. It's unbelievable when you can do that and, and control your life because you got to take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. Yeah. So, you're um you you were at you were at Boston. You were working with the with the Patriots. Seems like this might be the dream job of of a freaking doctor, right? You got the Super Bowl team. You got Brady. You got Gronk. You got Belichick. You got this. Seems like a yeah, pretty much a dream job for someone in your position. But you left. <laughs> <laughs> I left. Yeah. It, it, what what drew you away? I know. Statement to the question. <laughs> so not only that, Jocko, but growing up in New Hampshire, I, I lived through some pretty tough Red Sox years, yeah. pretty tough Patriots years. Yeah. And Kraft bought the team, and you know they had one playoff appearance before he <laughs> bought the team, and you've seen you've seen what they've done. Um, so it was my team. Yeah. Listened to it, watched it, everything. I. Uh, you know, part of it was, and I think the biggest thing was, it, it was almost, you know, like the Navy. I did 16 and a half years of active duty, then another 10 years of reserves. And I, I felt, number one, like I was ready for the next challenge, but also, you know, I had been gone a lot. You know, taking care of a pro team and, you know, to my colleagues that have done it much, much longer than I have, who are still doing it or are getting ready to do it, whether it's a college team, we're taking care of SEAL teams, or the Patriots, or who you, you name whatever team, pro team out there, Olympic, it's it's a massive time commitment. I bet if I added my hours up, which I did because Mass General wanted me to keep track of how many hours I did the Patriots, it was actually 55, 60 hours a week just to the Patriots, not let alone my surgeries and clinic and running the fellowship. So that, was that like your day job at, at Mass General? No, my day job was being an orthopedic surgeon and being head of sports at Harvard Mass General. That's that was my day job. That was right. a side gig <laughs> at fifty to sixty hours a week. So there's your answer, Jocko. Mm-hmm. I, I needed, you know, it gets back to your question about also taking care of yourself. I love the job, believe me. But you know, I had young I had young family I wanted to be around. I didn't I wanted to go to their games, you know, and because they're like, hey, um, they loved it. I mean, they got 50-yard line seats. I mean, they've been to a couple Super Bowls before the age of – they went to – my first Super Bowl was age 45. <laughs> they were at two Super Bowls before they were 14. You know, it was crazy. And they are there the whole week embedded with the team. I mean, talk about an incredible experience. But, you know, it's tough when they said, hey, are you going to Kansas City uh, this weekend or are you coming to my soccer game? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so – these are life choices, and I, I made a conscious life choice to, uh, you know, take a pause from that life, but mm-hmm. still continue to give back. And that's why we moved to Vail, Colorado, where you know, we take care of the ski team and a few other teams. I still I do some U.S. rowing team stuff, but I really just you know focused on uh, a family, enjoying what's you know in, in Vail, and also a, a busy practice where we take care of a lot of great you know athletes in all, all walks of lives. And that's at the uh, the Stedman Clinic? That's right, Chuck. Yeah, so what's the deal with the Stedman Clinic? Yeah, it's a guy named uh, Richard Stedman who started, actually started in, in Tahoe, and, and he actually just passed away this this past year. We had a big memorial service for him in June in, in, in Vail, and he really set up an incredible clinic that, you know, the culture just resonates with me so well. Why? Because it's, the, the motto is, just take great care of your patient and really focus on that, spend time with them, and truly try to do the best. And we get we get tough cases there. We get tough situations, patients with tough problems. And 
Um, but we get all, all walks of life. We get pro athletes, college athletes, uh, Olympic athletes. We're also one of the Olympic, um, the, the main Olympic uh, provider, USOPC provider from a musculoskeletal standpoint. So we work closely with the USOPC. So it's, it's really great to see uh, just all walks of life, <laughs> all kinds of you know, incredible, in, incredible athletes of, of all different disciplines and in, in, in sports. So I, I love the job, family. Uh, we love Vail. It's a, you know, it's like Coronado in the mountains in a way. You're seeing here in the mountains. It's a beautiful, but the weather's great. And we know you have winter and, you know, but we, we take care of, you know, advantage of all, all the seasons there. And, uh, you know, still occasionally I'd come back to San Diego and 72 and sunshine. I know you have it rough here, Jonko. <laughs> so how many hours a week do you work now? So now I'm probably fifty to sixty, sixty-ish. It's it's busy, but it you know I was I was well over I was well over one ten, one twenty, and if you, I mean I mean it's incredible, and you know the, 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 my hats off to like athletic trainers, therapists, everyone on these on these pro teams. So say we're playing Kansas City, you know, and Patriots on a Sunday night. Now you can do the game. You're there. The NFL makes you fly out Saturday morning, so you leave your family Saturday morning. I leave there super early Saturday. You got to do. You know, Belichick wants to know who's finally traveling with the team. You got to check out. You know, do a couple of final physicals. So you get there about 7 a.m. Saturday. You fly out, get to Kansas City, take the two planes, one or two planes, and um, private contracted plane. Now they have their own plane, or a lot of teams do. And you get to Kansas City, you're hanging out, you do the game. It's a Sunday night game, so you know the time on that. It's done late. About an hour later, you're an hour, hour and a half after the game. You're aboard the plane flying back to Providence. And you land at about 4 or 5 a.m., maybe with a couple hours of sleep. And then you're going to work the next morning. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes I'd try to go home, see the family, see the kids, and then go to work. And then you have a thing, phenomenon called post-game checks. And so Monday, we always do post-game mm-hmm. injury checks. And so the players would come in after a reasonable amount of sleep. And so if you're back early in the morning, you're seeing the players at 11 a.m., noon, something like that. And... So then your Monday's kind of gone, and then you're onto the then you're onto the next game. <laughs> it's a it's a very very busy life, and so mine was only part of that. People that are embedded with the team, the, again the athletic trainers, therapists, the tra- everyone. It, it's it's a very uh, busy life, especially during the season. And you were doing you this whole time. You were also up teaching. You were teaching. Did you teach at Harvard for a while? We did. We, we, uh, Jock, we all get an appointment at uh, Harvard, but what you, I mean, you're teaching residents, you're teaching fellows, people are through that, you know, that kind of five year system plus a year of fellowship. And you're also trying to do research, you're trying to publish papers, you're trying to do all these things that are quote unquote academic. They, they consider some of these practices, you know, academic because you're affiliated with the university mm-hmm. that they require because they want you to say, well, at Harvard, we discovered how to fix biceps tendons better and stronger with this thing and fix the hat, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And so we publish on that, and that's what they'd like you to do. And it's part of the quote unquote academic requirement, if mm-hmm. you will. So that, there's, a lot of, there a lot of, there's a lot of responsibilities. I mean, I, I love it, but you know, part of that conscious decision was to you know, uh, still do academics at Stebman Clinic, where we have a very robust lab we have phd scientists you got uh, you know people like mark philippon who just won an incredible you know award for all his work in in hip surgery we, we got we have great people that help us you know take super high-end care of our patients and we still can do research we can still teach you just take some other aspects because you, you only have so much time in the day mm-hmm. yeah I, I looked at your uh on linkedin you have your cv on there <laughs> and it's like it's literally over 110 pages. I think it's 111 pages or something like it's everything you've ever written and done. <laughs> I was like, what are we going to do? A 17 hour podcast? It was kind of crazy. Echo, that's why Echo Charles needed vacation, right? <laughs> Just um, to mentally prepare for this. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sorry you had to see that, actually. Uh, that was really just for my mom, but um, oh, no, well, it's... Even I was impressed. <laughs> I'm sure your mom was completely stoked. <laughs> no, it's, uh, yeah, I don't, it's kind of the way we just track what we do and, and, and you know, and how we, how we contribute to, you know, the, the, the craft we're in. So it's, that, that Jocko, though, is 100% a reflection of team. And I've always been about building a team those things and papers we publish and things we've written down are so many other 
people. Um, you know, I've got Tyler Zajac here with me, an incredible human, worked with me at the Patriots, and you know he's you know doing a ton of stuff you know for us and with uh, with some of our with some of our, our business things we, we have going on. But you bring people like that uh, into the fold and help mentor them. And, and give back. It's my time to, to give back. You know, it's not about me and not about me anymore. It's not about me at all. But all of that was only possible with a team and cultivating the team. And then there's, I, I look at, I look back at it, not too often, but I look back and it's just cool to see where all of those people and those names land and where they are now and what an incredible impact and impact much, even way, way beyond whatever I've done and many others have made. And, and I'm so proud of these people that. I've been able to, you know, help help along the way because now they're doing it way better than I ever did. Well, yeah, it's interesting too because I was, we have a friend that we trained with here, Doctor Luke Pomerantz. Yeah, and you know, I told him all. I said, yeah, we have another because he's an orthopedic surgeon. He's a hand specialist now, and I told him, oh yeah, we have a guy coming on, uh, you know, Doctor Matt Preventure, and, and he goes, oh yeah, he goes, oh yeah, I know. He goes, I guess he worked as some intern or whatever it is for you, but. He didn't talk about your surgery stuff. He just said, oh, he's really respected in the academic world for all the papers he's written. I was like, this guy's doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> Get a little bit crazy. Well, yeah, it's a little crazy. Yeah, no, uh, Pomerantz is great. He was with me at 17, did an incredible job, and um, I kind of turned over the reins as a senior medical officer there to him. He's done, he's done a great job and done way, way better than I have, taken it to the next level. So when you talk about these, quote, business things, yeah. That you and Tyler are working on these are business things. What does that What does that account for? Yeah, what is this all about? Guy. Well, we, I, my passions now are just it, it's it's really coming full circle. And you know, everything we sort of talked about, Jocko is I, I love the human performance side, helping people perform better, and helping those around me make informed decisions. Whether it's coach, whether it's Shemansky, Admiral, whether it's Jason, whether it, Giving people opportunities to make informed decisions with data is what I love to do based on what we know, based on what we know in human performance. And so one of the things we're working on, we call it the predictors, the predictors.com, but it's a it's looking at how we analyze human performance. Our motto is health matters. And health truly matters, you know, whether you're taking care of a SEAL team guy or NFL player or an NBA or, or what have you, it, it matters for how you perform, how you, when you come back, how you how you come back, and potentially what what else can happen. And so we're using you know, pretty heavy analytics and a lot of um, information that we uh, garner and have garnered over the years and cultivated to help. Uh, People, whether you're playing fantasy sports or, or gambling or betting or whatever you want to use it or teams that want to use it to be able to have you know information to make better informed decisions. Now, this is specific to NFL and you know future NBA and, and uh, NHL, baseball, that kind of stuff. And this is called the this is at thepredictors.com. That's right, Jock. And what yeah. people can go in there and enter data into they, the system. They can go and get information. Yeah, there's a lot of it, data, information, articles, etc., cultivated stuff that we have and. I think what we've done is kind of really take uh, AI and machine learning to the next level and really help interpret, you know, every little thing about, you know, what how a cornerback, how a running back, how a quarterback, how Brady's going to do in a performance. It's it's pretty cool stuff, and it's it's all about modeling and. But using you know health as one of the major mm -hmm. metrics on top of everything else that someone like Vegas or Fantasy Point predictions use things like that. It's pretty cool. When he, <laughs> when we know health, the, the thing is why it's called health matters is is health really matters. It, it's amazing because there's a reason why you turn on an NFL show and half of it's dedicated to injuries yeah. and when they're coming back. That's inter That's that's kind of amazing. You did all this stuff to help people. With Get better, heal, recover, and you're also going to help them in the gambling field. <laughs> help them with their, with their fantasy football. <laughs> that's right. However, they want to use it. Correct. Yeah, there, that's right. Is there any other business things that you have going on? Well, we're trying to help um, really deliver healthcare. I, I think in a more simplified, easier fashion. That, you know, as uh, administrators, doctors, nurses, techs, everything. There's, there's a ton of burnout in healthcare. Um, 
you know, all of us can get burnt out in our craft at times, but you know, health care was, was tough. It was tough after COVID, during COVID, et cetera. And so we're really trying to help um, make it better for the patient and make it better for the provider, the doc, the nurse, the PA, the tech. And through, like, through what mechanism? I mean, I got people like Scott Lagle working on delivery of healthcare much better through app mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Healthcare at your fingertips is really what we call it. And really trying to demystify the entire care, if you will, when you tear your biceps, mm -hmm. we know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And we're going to help you with that. How much, how much, how much competition is there from Google Medicine? Because <laughs> I am the Google Medicine master. I can basically, you know, uh, tell any listen to someone's symptoms, and I can tell them exactly what's wrong with them <laughs> myself and every other idiot on Google. But uh, w what's that like? Well, how's that changed the medical world? Yeah, Jocko, it's it, it's the real deal. I mean, it's uh, information at fingertips is, is very powerful and. For someone like you, I, I've actually almost joked that I would put a printer in my waiting room. You know, hopefully you don't have to wait too long, but say you don't. But I put a printer in my waiting room so that just in case you didn't get to print out your Google Medicine stuff, <laughs> you would be able to print it out and bring it to the yeah. clinic for the visit. Tell because, you well, this is what I've heard, and this is how we treat this biceps, and that's not right, and da-da-da-da, and I need a PRP, I need a biologic injection, I need some of my own stem cells, mm -hmm. I need some of this own stuff. I mean, it's really, it's actually great conversation starters in a way it's kind of opens the door but uh, sometimes it's too much i mean you yeah. got like 10 articles printed out you're like okay <laughs> well yeah because you can get one article that says one thing and you get another article that says the complete opposite so by the time totally. they come to you they're like lost totally yeah you gotta and you, you have to sift through that and that's where you're you know that's where experience comes through that's where you've done it before this is what we have found in our hands this works the best and, and look, I want to try to solve as much as we can without surgery. I mean, that's that's sports medicine mm -hmm. in, in essence. And we did that with your biceps. Mm -hmm. We solved without surgery. And you're still out there grappling no problem. Mm -hmm. And you didn't need to get it fixed, unlike Echo Charles. But <laughs> Twice. It, <laughs> Thank you. it was... Genetically weak. <laughs> <laughs> it was... We're, 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 always, uh, we're always trying to show those, you know, that... that, that cause and effect and use our experience and and coach patients, coach patients through a decision. I mean, my general mindset is said, listen, here are your options, everything from three no surgery options, we can do this, 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 and this, to here's surgery if that doesn't work out. And that, that's that's generally been a pretty good approach, you know, at least in my hands mm -hmm. with patients to give them the options, give them some information. You got to be careful of Dr. Google can, mm -hmm. can get in the way, but it, it also, I, I find it just opens up the conversation really well. Yeah. So, so what's the app then? The app is coordinate all this stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Provide information. Everything provides info. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And is this thing up and running? Is it available? It is. Yep. It's available. So yep. where can people find that? Yeah. It's uh, we have to get it through our clinic. Oh, <laughs> so okay. Now, yeah. So you got to come out to Stebman and we can get you hooked up with it. Are you planning to yeah. broaden this to let other people we use are. it? Yeah, we are. Just not yeah. there yet. Yeah. Not there yet. Is, is it in the works? It's in the works. Yes. All right. We can yeah, talk, on, talk offline <laughs> <Yes>. about that. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really close. And, the, and you know, what's amazing is, uh, you know, the DOD is super interested in, uh, you know, how we, how we deliver precision medicine mm -hmm. and, and healthcare. And so it's all the same themes that we've done since, since day one for me at Balboa, which is really what I love. So it's coming full circle again. <laughs> Yeah, it must be crazy because you're seeing a patient and then you don't see this patient again for six weeks or four weeks or three months. And like, what what, what, what did I talk to them about last time? And what information have they got in the meantime? And it just seems like if they automated that stuff and made it more friendly to the patient, obviously that would be helpful. Yeah, correct. So that's the type of thing exactly. this does? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, yeah. I should have started this company. What do you think, Echo? <laughs> Approved, yeah. There's, I like it. There's time. You can get in. <laughs> like I said, we'll talk offline. <laughs> exactly. So what else is... What else? What have we missed? I think you know. You know what's interesting? We, we touched on it a little bit. You know, I think the you know, some some of the things we get asked about a lot, and you know, probably you know, right here, right here at you know Victory MMA, you're, you've got people that are trying to you know perform. You're at professionals. They want they want to compete at the highest level, and we get a lot of questions about biologics. You know, what do we, meaning? Spin my blood down. Put in some PRP, platelet-rich plasma. Put in some 
stem cells, spin it down, and, and how does that help things? How does that do? Um, and I, I think that's a, a, a pretty unique field that's going to be rapidly emerging. And it, the nice thing about it, it's very precise. It's precise to you. But the, the problem is we're regulated by the FDA in terms of how much we can manipulate this blood product. So we have to, it's called minimally manipulated blood product rule by the FDA, um, Federal Drug Administration. So we can only do so much with it now. But that's why you see, well, so-and-so went out to Germany yeah. for a stem cell treatment. So-and-so went to South America or wherever. <clears throat> we're, we're regulated. And I think we're going to see this very exciting field continue to open up. We're, we're doing a ton of research and be on top of, you know, a lot of other places in the world in terms of how to optimize biologics for your precision game. Mm -hmm. So are you doing that right now? Are you doing what the FDA will allow you to do right now? Yeah, we're doing what the FDA allows us to do. Yeah. And and it must be pretty easy to to research this when Germany's doing it, Mexico's doing it, whatever, South America's doing it. Is it or no? Yeah, it's so we. Are, it, it it is. Um, yeah, again, Doctor Google, you have to be a little bit careful. But you have. Well, Google said <laughs> that out of Germany we have this, this, and this. Sometimes studies are hard to reproduce. You know, you don't have the same conditions. You don't have the same methodology. We're always scrutinizing that, and we want to, you know, of course, provide something that's going to be meaningful, that's going to be value driven, and you know, if you're gonna, you know, right now a lot of these are. are cash pay. There's really no insurer in the world that pays for biologics at this point. I think that's going to change, but when that does change, or even now, we want to provide value if you're going to pay for it. So we want to try to really titrate what, what conditions this works in, do better randomized trials, put in the biologic versus saline solution, and, and figure out what's going to work for your knee and hip and keep you, keep you going longer. What, what is the FDA, what's their concern? If they're doing it in Germany or something like it, or they're doing it in Mexico, something like it, what's their concern? Yeah, the, the concern, I, I, I think, is just keeping uh, con control of a biologic uh, product in that it is something, something that they know what the end product is. And I, I think you know, it's, it's a little more complex than that, but... I think it's going to change at some point, <laughs> and it, 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 it needs it it to. So we can do it. Legislation to change, like right now? Are they currently no, looking I, at it? Not that I know of. No, but we, we need to we need to work on. So that. we're stuck going overseas if you want these kind of treatments. If you want some, you know, more extravagant, advertised, quote unquote, stem cell, basically concentrating stem cells. So if we take blood off your pelvis mm -hmm. with a needle, you know, we take and concentrate it. We, the stem cell population of that blood is probably less than 1%. It's not a lot, mm -hmm. but we can't concentrate it. We can only minimally manipulate it. So we have to put back in what we can, we spin it down, there's only so many things we can do. But in Germany, they can concentrate it. You can amplify it. You can do other things. You can do uh, PCR techniques, all this other stuff to help amplify and, and get a much more robust stem cell products. So that's basically what you're getting when you go overseas. And, and then is it beneficial? Is it more beneficial? They say it is. You know, we can't study in the United States. So we don't really know at this mm -hmm. point. So what about what about the studies from Germany? They're promising. Yeah, I think it's 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 promising, and we'll, we'll get there. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that comes from overseas. It just takes a little longer for our F mm -hmm. FDA to get through, but we're we're getting there. Let's go FDA, <laughs> get it together. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I mean the other thing I know I mentioned to Jocko is your uh, you know the, the supplements. I mean I got to congratulate. I think you you know this <laughs> you didn't even know I was going to talk about this, but I'm going to is uh, you've done a great job with this because I, I think you know that you need to perform and continue performing in your gym so you can hang or at least partially hang with some of these professional athletes that I saw hanging around today. It's pretty impressive, but it's some beasts in here for sure. Yeah, there's no question. But you're. I mean, your stuff from the greens to the, you know, the joint warfare, the Jocko Comet tested in the Mulk. And I mean, all, all this stuff, I'm really, I've been studying it. It's, it's, it's good stuff. It's all natural. I, I use it. And, you know, the, it, it kind of taken the right approach uh, from a supplement standpoint to, to help optimize. Um, I can tell you, I feel better on it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the one of the I think one of the most impressive um, confirmations of the efficacy of it is the subscribers. So people subscribe to joint warfare. They subscribe to the greens. Like they get that and they take it. And they've you know we've got people that have been taking this stuff for two three years now, and they you know they're they're subscribed to it. They're not going on. I say all the time. I'm I you, you won't get me to not be on this stuff because the way it makes me feel even the 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 time war which anecdotal it improved my vision it made my vision better i had a we have a certain uh, size monitor that we use at some of our events and there'll be notes on the monitor and we do a duplicate event every six months or so and at one you know i showed up at one of the events the next event i show up and I'm looking down at the downstage monitor and I say, did we get bigger monitors? And they're like, no, it's the same monitor. And I said, did we get, are we using the bigger fonts or something? And they're like, no, it's the same exact slides. <laughs> and I said, this is freaking awesome. Like I can see way more clearly. And I've always been blessed with good vision, unfortunately, not like you or, you know, not like you, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. you got you got jinxed. Right. I was blessed with, I've always had good vision. I'm 52 years old. I see a lot of people, knock on wood, I see a lot of my friends, they're having to get you know reading glasses and whatnot. I'm still able to be okay, but I was starting to see a little bit of degradate. Don't tell anyone, Echo Charles. <laughs> I was starting to see like a little bit, occasionally a little degradation, and I was like, oh no. And then sure enough, now it's time more, now I can see again, like clear. So the stuff is, is effective, we're testing it like crazy. Um, great people helping us put together so maybe you'll be on that now yeah no it's i i, I take it and it's got even the time war stuff has this the, the target of what's in there is to the mitochondria which yep. is the the energy machine of the of the cell and to be able to provide that anti-aging you know cellular support improve nad levels which is what we use for energy uh you know can help cells turn over better, get rid of dead cells, you promote uh, cardiovascular effects, eyes, heart health, et cetera. That's, that's all what this is targeted to and all done in a very natural way, which I, I, I applaud you for, Jocko. It's, it's the right approach and the right way to look at a, a line. Because you know if you just sell NAD3, like that's that's too hard. I, I applaud how you, you know, I'm putting my MBA hat on now, which I <laughs> did when I was bored and finished, finally finished up during COVID, was um, the subscription model, like you said. So it's, it, it, that's not going away. It's, it's you know, you know, it's done a great job because that's the hardest thing to keep with a customer mm-hmm. is keeping them going and, and renewing that. So I, I applaud you for it. I, I think it's the way you put it together, put together the line together. It makes it, it very simple. It's stuff that we can use and apply you know, not only to our patients, but mm-hmm. to our everyday life. Freaking tastes good too, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I showed up here today. I did legs today, by the way, Echo Charles. Good job. Okay. And then I didn't, then I had call, 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 came right here. I was going catabolic, let's be frank. But I rolled right in here, grabbed a vanilla, ready to drink milk, hammered that thing, 30 grams of protein, coming in hot. Uh, All right, I don't want to turn this into, you know, an infomercial for Jocko Fuel. (laughs) No, and I didn't, this was not planned. I didn't, you know, I I, I came here with with this just because it's... It's good stuff. Well, I appreciate it. it. And, you know, coming from somebody of your background, obviously that's that's awesome to hear. Um, For sure, you know, that's, that's like what better seal of approval than someone like yourself that's worked with the highest performing people in the world and is a freaking doctor from Dartmouth. I mean, let's go. So much appreciated. Uh, what else? Is there anything else? Does this get us up to speed? Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's pretty comprehensive, Jocko. Yeah, sorry to take up so much of your time. <laughs> no, not at all. And, you know, I think, I think when you come back on, what yeah. we'll do is we'll roll in with, like, a legit, like, best practices, protocols, just yeah. for, reco- for 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 injury prevention, for recovery, and then like post surgery. Because let's face it, most people are going to get surgery at some point in their life. Uh, I had neck surgery. Echoes had a couple surgeries on his body. So, do you have knee surgeries too? Yeah, knee surgeries. So we're going to get surgery. So it's good to know some kind of protocols around that. We can do that next time you come on. That'd be awesome. And uh, 
Yeah, but is yeah. there anything else for today? No, love it. No, I think I, th- I think that'd be great. I think understanding some, you know, specific injuries, optimizing human performance, optimizing your health, putting these elements together in your own life that we've talked about, you know, since day one mm-hmm. at, at the teams. That's that's reasonably available to most of you out there. Yeah. We and you've helped that with your company, and now to really holistically look at how you want to achieve your goals, what you want to do, sports specific, precision medicine stuff. These are all things that we can help you with, things that we're, you know, frankly specialists of and and really like to optimize that because there's nothing that puts a smile on my face better than seeing you be able to go back to what you want to do, to be able to play with your kids, to be able to enjoy life, to be, whether it's a full professional athlete to what we say the weekend warrior, I want you to be able to get back there, and there's nothing that makes me happier. Yeah, and we take it for granted. I mean, I take my health for granted every day, and, and then all of a sudden I get injured. All of a sudden, I, you know, my knee gets tweaked, my back gets tweaked, whatever. And then you go, oh, my gosh. So let's get ahead of it, first of all, get some protocols in place, and then let's get ready to respond to it when it happens, and then let's get ready to recover from it. Those are... Things you got to do. Things you got to do. Echo Charles. Yes, sir. You got any questions? Yes. Because I know you're over there. Football. We got right. surgeries. Right. Hard over what do you got? You're uh, taking notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, so I talk to Dr. Luke about this every once in a while, where, you know, how the, a typical person, they see like an injury, you know, on Instagram, you know, like Dean likes to post these ones. The gymnastics get her, gets her, uh, or the gymnastics practitioner gets her knee bent back. The right, right. Me, like a lot of people, we see that kind of stuff, and we're like, bro, I don't want to look at that. It like makes you quit. You know, you can't look at that kind of stuff. But w- was that ever a problem for you? And then, if so, how did you uh, get past it? Yeah, you know, Echo Charles, the, the first real up and close I, I had of that was in the cadaver lab at, at Dartmouth in Hanover, New Hampshire. And you, you walk in, and you've got this 40 cadavers. I mean, it's it's a human body Mm -hmm. deceased and filled with formaldehyde and so you walk in and you've got this forever etched in my brain smell of formaldehyde in the cadaver lab in the basement of Dartmouth Medical School and you're starting to cut open someone's skull to get at their brain and you get over it pretty quickly I'll tell you you have to and if you don't um it's pretty hard to study anatomy and <laughs> pass anatomy and get through medical school. So, uh, but you, I mean, there's nothing that really, there's no like cadaver prep course. It's just, yeah. I mean, they, they tell you how to, you know, what's going to go on and what to expect and things yeah. like that. And I, with the injuries, I, I'll, I'll tell you what's, what's really important is, um, you know, you talk about this knee bent backwards and things like that. So on the sideline, just so you know, we have, you know, I mean, there's a ton of healthcare professionals on the sideline of an NFL game, but we also have access to the video of the injury. Right. Super yeah, that's the, see exactly what powerful, happened. super powerful to be able to analyze it. You know, hit Jim Whalen, head trainer, is like, okay, check check uh, so and so's knee out. Okay, da, 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 check the knee. Do this. Go check the video. I'll, I'll, I'll take care. Go come back. Go check the video. Video and come back. Video and come back. So. Mm. I get, you know, Zajac here, he's helping me out. We're here on the sideline. We get everything dialed. But that, that video of the injury, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, obviously the sensationalized ones, and these, you know, bent back knees and all the tough ones we see or the bad ankle, the fractured dislocations and blood on the field or in the ring or cage match or whatever you have is, you know, is all there. It's part of some of these sports. Yeah. yeah. You would like this job because you watch that over and over again yeah. and see what happened. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, two, that's hard to two watch. things on this. My daughter just graduated from Cal Poly, and she w- she had cadaver labs, mm-hmm. and she would kind of like text me. I was just cutting open a cadaver. <laughs> that's yeah. number one. Number two, she just got hurt doing ju- doing the jujitsu. Mm-hmm. She was rolling with tabs. You know tabs? Yeah, tabs. Alex, and I was videoing. You know, just like just like showed up. I was kind of on the mat, just videoing, mm-hmm. and she got her toe. Like he landed on her foot and her toe got bent Ooh. all the way up to touch the top of her foot. I have it on video. <laughs> and I watched the video because I couldn't really tell what happened. Yeah. And I watched the video and I was like, oh no, like this is bad. 
And sure enough, she's like, you know, she's young and she's very athletic and she just healed like Wolverine blood. <laughs> sure. <laughs> she's pretty much good to go it's now. In, it's yeah. in her DNA. But yeah. I watched it and I go, I was like, oh my gosh, she's injured. Like this is going to be a long time. And she wouldn't watch it. She's yeah. like, I'm not watching no. it. I don't want to see that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see yeah. I'll show it to you later. Echo no, Charles. thank you. It's jacked thank up. You, but, yeah. is, it, is it worse? So I think the, and this is me personally, like the cadaver part, that's less squeamish than the injury especially when it happens but you know like okay so great train right mm-hmm. x-ray tech so he and he's in the trauma center trauma mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so he sees all the car accident people oh, and yeah. you know the the femur sticking yeah. or the tbs sticking out of the leg like that kind of stuff oh, so yeah. that stuff messes me up <laughs> yeah. or the that kind of, but the, the dead people not not as much or like even like the cutting open i think not as much but just like the crazy trauma part of it is there do you lean towards one as being like less sensitive overly sensitive. as far as like what what gets <laughs> to you or got to you back in the day echo <laughs> psychosis <laughs> right yeah, now yeah. dude yeah no i think I, no it's just none of that really phases me now and i'd say probably most you know orthopedic surgeons do you know because right. you're just you know you're conditioned to it you're part of it you're in the system and certainly may you know certainly may at first you know i will you know some of the you know we mentioned it earlier so some of the things that still give me a little bit is you know some of the we use special instruments to cauterize or you know some of the burning flesh reminds me of oh, yeah, yeah. you know the the wounded warrior mm-hmm. blown off limb type days that that's what personally still mm-hmm. gets me which is you know pretty heavy for me personally and i know many of my colleagues as well but it's you, you kind of get used to it. How about when you're stuff. just breaking out like a chisel and a hammer? <laughs> yeah. Because that's what you yeah. do, right? Yeah, no, of course. The first thing I look at is how sharp it is. Like, yeah. I'm like, how, okay, is this thing sharp? <laughs> is this thing got it's a good work. blade? Because, you know, sometimes you, you know, you dinged it on something or the bone is super hard and the thing's dull. And I'm like, oh, I got to get another chisel. Because <laughs> that's what you're doing. Like, you're, yeah. you're, yeah. like, you're going to do a knee replacement surgery on someone. You got to hack through some bone yeah yeah you need you need good chisels you gotta hack through you, you need <laughs> our, we, we have we have great, whatever business i got you you just lost <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> sorry got, bro yeah no no we're, we're <laughs> elegant we're elegant about it but the, the the way to be elegant is to have great instrumentation i mean we, we our, our drills our burrs our saws and things like that i mean these are surgical level i mean they're really really nice and super high rpms and dremels that are like at 50,000 70,000 rpms so it spins so fast that it doesn't wrap up tissue it doesn't wrap up a nerve or wrap up a vessel and cause all kinds of harm so we, we have some we have some pretty cool stuff it's expensive like why is it it's, it's this stuff's you know it's expensive drills are probably Twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. Oh, just dang. to have the Dewalt doesn't cut the DeWalt it. Dewalt doesn't get. <laughs> it. You think it would, but the it, Milwaukee it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. It's expensive. So if you, um, okay, so you, you're doing a surgery. I don't know shoulder, right? And do you see that as just more of a specimen, more so than like, oh, this is a person's shoulder, and you're relating it to your own shoulder and all this stuff or whatever? It's just more like a like a di- not a diagram, but like a specimen. You know, that's how you see it. Yeah, I think it, yeah, I think it's that, Uncle Charles. You're you're following the process for what this patient has to get them better, and you know we all want our patients to do well, and so we're trying to follow the process, understand what we're doing ahead of time. You know, we're meeting you we're again right before surgery, right before you go to sleep, and so you know, it's very for me, it's very personal it's still. You know, you want oh, that, yeah. and everyone's got a little bit different. You know, although it might be the same procedure four or five, six times in a row, just based on the day you have. Mm. Everyone's pathology, anatomy is different. We're all, we're all human, we're, we're different. Huh. So then even if like you know the person personally, it's still the same protocol for you then. Yeah, because that must have been weird, because in yeah. the SEAL teams, you were working with guys you knew. Yeah, yeah. I figured that'd be different. Yeah, and, and here's, oh, here, so here's a, a great one for you, and you, you, know, you deal with this in the teams, is you're operating on a colleague, an orthopedic surgeon, or a neurosurgeon, or you know, some of the teams that knows enough and like, hey, um, Preventure, I know you're going to do my surgery next week or in a few days next week. And uh, I've got the anesthesiologist for you picked out. Really good, really good person. Um, she's going to do my anesthesia. And uh, so-and-so, this tech is really good I've worked with as well or something. They're going to do the tech. And I'm like, dude, no. 
let me take care of you, okay? <laughs> let me let me go in with my A team. Let me go in with my platoon. Right. And let me know the people I work with because that's what you want all the time. And they think they're kind of doing your service. Oh, I got so and so to cut off vacation. They're going to do anesthesia for me and this and that. And I'm like, dude, fine, but no. <laughs> let me just take care of you that we know how to do yeah. at the highest level. I would not give any input. Other than like, I trust you. Do yeah. what you gotta do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A team. What about um, as far as surgeries go? What's the most? I mean, probability wise, right? Someone's coming in. You got a surgery today. What's the most common injury you think? Like, what do you think that surgery is going to be most likely? Yeah, a lot. A lot of what I do is you know, shoulder needs. So we're fixing ligaments. We're fixing meniscus, cartilage. Uh, shoulder, rotator cuff injuries, cuff tears, biceps, labrum injuries, things like that. Th those are kind of the common shoulder and knee things we see. Mm. Is there anything um, game changing for, for like ligaments coming or is are we just going to be using cadavers and whatever, taking it from another part of your body? Are we still there? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, you got an ACL tear and you're reasonably young, you use your own tissue. But guess what? Nothing's for free. In orthopedics, nothing's for free if we take it from your body. We take it from another spot of your body. Nothing's for free mm -hmm. because you might have pain there. You might have a little bit of deficiency. You might have, if we harvest a hamstring for your ACL, I might have a little hamstring weakness. If you, Where does that manifest? If you're trying to bring your heel to your buttock, you might get a little hamstring weakness mm -hmm. there. So we try to really make an individualized approach. And if you're someone who needs their uh, foot all the way up to their buttock really quickly, hurdler, high jumper, uh, maybe a grappler, depending on you know how you're behaving on the mat. Um, long jumper, so maybe a sprinter. You need that flexion torque mm -hmm. of the knee. Maybe the hamstring is not the best graph. But we were what, what I think the biggest thing, Jocko, is we're trying to get uh, better biology, better healing to get you back quicker. You know, current state of the art for an ACL surgery is still about seven to nine months because of muscle, hamstring, oh. core. I mean, that's. I hear your I hear your breath. It's it's a lot. Yeah. I mean, that would that would crush someone like you. And yeah, you know, Charles. Right now, that being yeah. said, I mean, you've had ACL, right? That's that was going to be my last and final question. I promise. Mm -hmm. So when I had, I was nineteen, yeah. by the way, though. Okay. So yeah. a lot different than <laughs> you know my current state of being. But I had ACL surgery, a little bit meniscus. I was cleared to play in three and a half months. No, None of my coaches believed it. They were like, we're not going to put you in or whatever, but all the doctors and all my tests all passed three and a half months. Um, I, but then it made me think when you mentioned the ligamentation part of it, because mm -hmm. I don't know how much they – or how can they even test that mm -hmm. without, I don't know, some weird – ray gun or something <laughs> because you know the the test for that is like there's all these like exercises you got to do but then there's this cybex machine that like you got to have a certain amount of strength certain amount of strength yep. back right hamstring yep. um and what do you call it, patella like or, or flexion and, and and extension or whatever and then all this other stuff that i had to do and at like three months they were like hey you're impressively close given how quick this is and then at three and a half months they were like you pass all the minimums to actually go play Echo Charles, you may actually have that Wolverine, little bit of Wolverine situation little going little on Wolverine around your knee. Yeah, yes, sir. I would no. say. Back no, that's, in the day. But, but you, you passed. We, we, we look at functional screening. We look at all these other things. But you went through some functional screening, and, and the docs that you were with felt that you were ready to go. And you probably passed those with flying colors. That's amazing. And that's, but that was, a, that was a big part. We can definitely get people like you back that are – Supra physiologic have access to all the best stuff, access to all the best care, but there, there's a risk if you go back early because that ligamentization and biology hasn't fully taken hold, mm -hmm. and that that rupture risk of your ACL is probably highest between three and five months, three and six months, maybe a little bit longer. Why? Because the because the muscles are so strong and stuff, but the ligamentation is weak. Kind of a scenario. Yeah, the body it just hasn't fully healed to the bone, and your muscles are, are weak, like you said. Yeah, it's bad. Thanks. Bad so the combo muscles. You got weak lucky. Is what I heard. Yeah, the muscles but, are weak. Is what I heard. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I thought maybe the muscles are strong, but the ligament, you know. So I might be out there running routes or whatever, make a cut, and my muscles can do it. But the, you know, how like your ligaments kind of hold your bone, or they do hold your bone together. So my bone might slide in a way that. Yep. I don't know. He, that, that was that's another claim thing. from Echo Charles. He claims to have loose knees. Is that a thing? 
It is, yeah. They're yeah, hyper hyper laxity. I'll totally let knees. you check it, yeah, and I you can, can be like, you know. "Hey, these are loose." Yeah, I mean, or whatever your conclusion yeah. is. Um, but the uh, one key factor is I focus super super hard on the on the physical therapy. Like I treated it like a workout p- program. Yeah, and, and I, I think you're a testament to if you want to get back from injury, from surgery, from non operative, whatever is quick as possible. You, you have to you have to spend the time because it's the, the body shuts down. It's not your fault, but it's what we call proprioception or how you know where your joint is behaving in space and these other things and how your kinetic chain is just kind of shut down. You got your kinetic chain back really quickly, Echo Charles, and that's that's a testament to who you are and, and, and what you did. But for those listening, if you want to do this, you don't want to overdo it and you still have to follow recommendations and follow the protocol, but you can get yourself back efficiently and safely through these means. Sure. Awesome. Good to meet you in person. Um, so, where can people find you? We, the, you're on you're on Twitter and Instagram. You're at Doctor Preventure. Um, you're on Facebook at Matthew Preventure MD. You're on you got a YouTube channel. We do. Not highly active right now. Nope. <laughs> it's but coming. it is there. You're yeah. probably working it. It's coming. That's uh, probably by the time you hear this, it'll be more a little more active. Matthew Preventure 28. That's right. 28 what's that 28 have to do with Ooh, I don't know what that is yeah no. it's your YouTube channel your name's on it and you're in the YouTube videos <laughs> yeah so, so it's, it's out it's, there it's definitely me yeah so we so we another one of my side job businesses is we're the um, in our third year of working with Fox Sports as their director of performance and injury analytics and so we've been going up to LA in the Fox Sports studios and working really closely with them to help uh, especially on their digital media God. side, to do uh, injury interpretations. How does What does it look like when Mahomes hurts his ankle when, mm-hmm. in playoffs? And what's it going to look like for the Super Bowl? How's the Super Bowl going to be for him? So we do a lot of analytics. We do a lot of uh, broadcasts. We do podcasts. We do video, uh, all affiliated with Fox Sports. So so all that stuff can be found on Fox Sports? And Fox Sports as well and the, the predictors.com and you know, also at uh, the Stedman Clinic. Um, uh, MatthewPreventureMD.com yep. as well. Yeah. MatthewPreventure.com is like your main place. You can find yep. these other things linked from exactly. there. Exactly. Yep. Awesome. That's where yep. we can find you. Thank you, Doctor. Any closing thoughts from you? No, I just I just want to you know thank you know everyone that's been been a part of this journey. It, it's truly been um, humbling when you know someone was not gonna be able to fly the jet back in the day and. <laughs> This kid from New Hampshire in the sticks that has now been to 50 countries and, and seen the world, you know, to, to inspire and, and give back. Any of you out there can can do that and achieve this and achieve, you know, really great things. And I, I just want to thank all of my mentors and incredible people, so many of which, you know, we didn't even close get close to get mentioning today, but that have helped me along my journey because I'm truly indebted and, and humbled to those those around. I'm, I'm indebted to my team, my family, my mom, dad, my brother, uh, wife and kids. And I really want to thank uh, all of them for enduring the journey as well because it, it, it takes it takes a village to, to do what we all do around this table. And I, I'm so appreciative. And then lastly, you know, Jocko and Echo Charles, really honored to be here today and honored to be on your podcast. And I'm really uh, proud of what you've all done and how you represent, uh, you know, the community that I had, you know, a very small part of, of being a part of. Yeah, appreciate that, Doc. And, um, you know, again, thanks. To, you know, we, we're talking to you, but as you said, I know and you know the many hundreds of people that have participated in in making all this stuff happen uh so thanks to all those people thanks to you for coming down thanks for joining us um most important thanks for your service you know we barely touched on 27 years in the u.s navy that's just awesome and what you were doing that whole time taking care of our wounded and our injured warriors uh i know so many friends that you literally personally took care of and got them either back on the battlefield or to live the best possible life that they could live with the wounds that they received. So thanks for all you did for us and thanks for all you're continuing to do now to uh, make people healthy. I don't think there's any greater service than that. So thanks for everything, Doc. 
Jocko, thanks a lot. Health matters, and let's keep the journey going. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. And with that, Doc Preventure has left the building. Got to stay healthy, Equitronals. Yes. And then if you take a hit, you got to get back. Get back. Get back in the game. Need to be on the path. Need to stay on the path. It's a big part of being on the path. It's true. He, he mentioned something that I, it took me like probably a good 10 minutes to kind of not kind of clarify it in my own head. And it was this where he was like and he spoke about his maybe early experience where he maybe implied or whatever that he was kind of surprised that the that the guys want, wanted so much to get back mm-hmm. onto the battlefield mm-hmm. when it's like, dude, you, you're all jammed up. Yeah. It's kind of like, why do you want to go? On? It's like there was, and I'm not saying he was saying that, but it was like that was kind of what was going on, right? Like kind of maybe in his head, mm-hmm. or was he talking about somebody else at that? He was talking about himself, right? He was saying these guys wanted to go back on the battlefield, and he's looking at him like, hey, man, you may not walk again, and you want to go back. Damn. Right. Yeah. Like, like all that is respect going on, to the thing. highest level, admiration to the highest level. That's yeah. what he's saying. Yeah. So it felt like what? I'm trying to reconcile or trying to relate maybe to what goes on in someone's mind that's like, oh, yeah, I don't care about that kind of stuff. I just want to go back out. And it's one of those, I guess, maybe to use a common term, like their dedication to duty, their dedication to their job. For sure. And I kind of think I was not in the military. You know that about me. But I kind of think it's one of those things where they actually enjoy the environment, like enjoy the I don't necessarily enjoy war and all that part of it, but the environment they enjoy the environment you know what you're missing is just they just want to be with their brothers yeah and that's what that's <clears> what <throat> that's i think is the is the element of the environment that makes yeah. the whole environment now mm. no matter how shitty it is the whole environment uh what they want to be in is yes because of their brothers so like yeah and it's obviously you can make that easy comparison to like a, a sports person you know or, or a professional athlete even like a college athlete even a Pop Warner athlete, where it's like, because that's the first thing you ask the doctor when you, you know, jam up your knee or your ankle or whatever, and they'd be like, hey, they'll look at the x-rays, and the first thing you wonder is like, how long am I out? Because mm-hmm. I want to, yeah. you know, get back or whatever. It's the like same exact thing, but it doesn't seem like the same exact thing because it's, as far as that little no, element It's not goes, the same exact thing. It's, there's a similarity between the two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but as far as the mindset, it's not yeah. like, oh, you know, like freaking... Sure, I'm jammed up, but at least I don't have to do that anymore. Kind of, it's not that it doesn't exist, you mm-hmm. know, kind of a thing. So I was like, "Huh, that is crazy. Mm-hmm. It's extreme dedication of our military personnel. Yes, That's sir. what it is. Yes. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Um, yeah. So but yeah, he spoke about Jocko Fuel. Yeah, he did. Yeah. So hey, man, that does man. That's a big part of it. Nutrition, mm-hmm. supplementation, all this stuff. Getting staying on the path, uh, getting on the path, staying on the path, getting. Back on the path. Yeah. Trust me, it's a big one. Yeah, we well, yeah, like you said, he talked about it, and uh, not much I can say to to double down on all, all the stuff that he was talking about. Just the, the, you know, he and he brought like a whole review. He brought like a whole typed out review yeah. of all of our different supplements and like what the benefits were and how good they were. Yeah. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, so, I, I was kind of impressed too. But then after like a few seconds, I was like, wait a second. Of course he did. Yeah. Freaking doctor over here. Of course, mm-hmm. that's what he did. That's mm-hmm. I think that's probably what most doctors would do yeah. when that kind of stuff. He's like, and that was like the first thing he talked to when he got here today. He was just talking about like joint warfare. He's talking yeah. about time war. He's talking about Mulk. Like he's just, he's just, he's just, it's awesome. Yep. So there you go. Go to jockofuel.com and get some of this awesome stuff so you can stay healthy and stay in the game. Oh, yeah. That's what we're doing. You can get it at Wawa. You can get it at Vitamin Shop. Get it at GNC. You can get the military commissaries. AFES, Hannaford, Dash Stores, Wakefern, ShopRite, HEB down in Tejas, Meyer up in the Midwest, Harris Teeter, Lifetime Fitness, Shields, those big Shields stores, dang, 300,000 square feet of goodness. You can get Jocko Fuel in there. Small gyms, actually, out there, little gyms, little CrossFit gyms, little Jiu Jitsu gyms. They have it, and if you own a CrossFit gym, or you own a little gym, you own a Jiu-Jitsu Academy, email jfsales at jockofuel.com. Get, st- sell the stuff wholesale. First of all, take care of your people, take care of your clientele, take care of your students, and also add a little bit to the bottom line, right? Make a little bit more money. Look, I know what it's like, I own a gym. I know that it's, it's lean in the gymnasium. 
It's lean in the jiu-jitsu academy. Mm-hmm. It's lean in the CrossFit box. Guess what? Get yourself a little bit more supplemental income. And, and in the meantime, take care of your clientele. Like I said, JF Sales at JockoFuel.com. That's what we're doing. Check it out, JockoFuel.com. Go get some. What else we got? It's true. Got Origin USA. Boom. American made apparel, durable goods, jujitsu geese, mm-hmm. rash guards, the whole deal. Stuff made in America. That's not, it's not as common as you might think. No, it's not as common as you might think. In fact, it doesn't really exist yeah. other than what we're doing here at OriginUSA.com and these other companies that are out there that's saying that they care about the environment. And they say they care about people. Mm-hmm. They don't care about either. They're lying to you. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to cover it up by saying they give, you know, 1% to the environment or whatever they're saying. Mm-hmm. I'm giving 1% of the environment, but I'm building a factory in a place that has no regulations whatsoever. And they're just going to le- allow me to dump chemicals into the atmosphere and dump chemicals into the river and dump gra- chemicals into the ocean. That's what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. But, but uh, no, no, I'm a nice person. I'm giving my 1%. Oh, no, I care about people. That's why I have a slave labor plant in China. Because I care about people so much. These people are liars. Don't do it. Don't support them. Don't support these communist regimes. Don't support the adversaries of freedom. The adversaries of America. Help the national security of this country. Go to originusa.com, buy a pair of blue jeans. Buy a freaking hoodie. I know it's summertime. I know there's a heat wave going on. The heat wave is going to end. It's going to get cold. Even out there in Arizona, it's going to get cold. Even in New Mexico, it's going to get cold. Even in eastern California, out in the Imperial Valley, where it's 120 degrees right now, Mm. it's going to get cold. Get a hoodie. Get a pair of jeans. Get a jiu-jitsu gi. Get rash guards. Originusa.com. American made. Let's go. It's true. Also, Jocko's store called Jocko Store. Go to JockoStore.com for this stuff. Discipline equals freedom. Mm-hmm. Got some shirts on there, some hats on there, some hoodies on there. Lightweight and regular weight. I'm not gonna say heavy. Mm-hmm. Do you guys a disservice there? But yes. So yes, JockoStore.com. Also, there's a uh, a little program subscription program called the shirt locker new shirt every month. Different kind of designs, but same same vein, different design. I saw a lot of. Uh, Shirt locker Represent. situations going on <laughs> yeah. at the Jocko Live events. Yep, it was kind of impressive. Yeah, it was kind of is very impressive. That's that's like it's people just ultimate game is yep. you're just out there representing while on the path. Oh, so yeah. JockoStore.com, thanks also, for thanks for the support on the shirt locker. If you know, sometimes people are like, oh, what does that even mean? The d- oh, different kind of designs, whatever. You can go if you go to the the website and you click on. Um, the shirt locker, it'll show, if you scroll down a little bit, it'll show like a sneak peek of this month's one. It won't show the whole shirt, but you get a little a little of what's kind of going on at the in the current moment. I was going to show you next month's design. I was going to do it. I got inspired by design I saw in Hawaii. Okay. But we'll check it out after this. Good. But yes, JockoStore.com. All right, also, subscribe to this podcast. Subscribe to JockoUnderground.com. Subscribe to your YouTube channel. Subscribe to Psychological Warfare. Go to flipsidecanvas.com and get some cool stuff to hang on your wall that's made by an American hero, Dakota Meyer. Mm -hmm. Books, I've written a bunch of books, get them. I've written a bunch of kids' books. Look, prioritize your kids. This isn't like when you're on an airplane and the mask comes down from the ceiling, you gotta take care of yourself first. In this situation, I'd say take care of your kids first. Mm -hmm. Get your kid the way of the warrior kid books. Because guess what? You read them, it's gonna help you too prioritize and execute for your neighbor, your neighbor's kids, your your nephew, your niece, your grandkid. Get them these books. Make their entire life better. So there you go. Bunch of books. You know what they are. Echelon Front. We solve problems through leadership. Go to echelonfront.com. We just sold out the uh, Dallas muster. We're going to sell out what we do. So if you want to come to one of our events, go to echelonfront.com, check out events, FTX, Council, Battlefield, just all kinds of awesome events going on. So check those out. We have a women's assembly coming up. Jamie Cochran, the COO of Echelon Front, she is running a leadership seminar for women. 
So September 14th through the 16th in Phoenix, Arizona, check that out. Also, we have an online training academy, extremeownership.com. Leadership is a skill. Life is a skill. Isn't that weird? People say life skills. I'm going to tell you life is a skill. And one of the skills, one of the skills of life is leadership. And it helps you in every aspect of life. It's little tricks. It's little techniques, tactics, and procedures that you can actually use. And it's going to make your entire life better. Go to extremeownership.com. Take some classes. There's a free class on there. There's a free class. The barriers to extreme ownership. Take that free class. I'm just giving you something for free that's going to help every aspect of, of your life. We have the framework of extreme ownership. Go take that class. It's free. Don't, I don't want anything from you. Just go take that class. It's going to make your life better. We'll start there. Then if you need more, you can get more. There's a couple other free courses, but start with those two. We're here to help you become a better human. ExtremeOwnership.com. And if you want to help service members active and retire, you want to help their families, you want to help Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom. Mama Lee, she's an incredible woman. She has an incredible charity organization that is truly and pragmatically helping veterans. There's no, there, there's no like mystery as to what she's doing. She's got programs that are set up that are having a huge impact on veterans and Gold Star families as well. So if you want to donate or you want to get involved, go to America's Mighty Warriors dot org, and also don't forget about Heroes and Horses. Dot org. We got Micah Fink. He's in the hinterland. He's up in the wilderness right now. Last report was he had he was living in a cave, in a small cave with a couple bears, and he was the alpha. That's the last report that I got. So he is taking veterans up into the wilderness so they can find themselves. Heroes and Horses dot org. Also, if you want to connect with us on the on the interwebs, Doc Preventure. MatthewPreventure.com. He's got thepredictors.com. He's on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Preventure. He's on Facebook at Matthew Preventure MD. He's got a YouTube channel, Matthew Preventure28. So that's where you can find the Doc and also Echo. Is that Echo Charles? I am at Jocko Willink. And we're on the social media platforms. We're on there. Just be careful. You guys know the deal. The algorithm is there to grab you and try and try and utilize your brain for its profit. That's what they're trying to do. Trying to utilize your brain for its profit. It's like the Matrix in the the movie The Matrix. They're trying to utilize your body in that movie for what? Fuel? What is it? Heat? Yeah, fuel, battery. Battery? Batteries. Yeah. Yeah. This is the opposite. They use your mind for their profit. So don't let it happen. That's what I'm saying. Also, thanks to all the military personnel out there, obviously. Thanks to Doc Preventure for coming down here. And thanks to, a special thanks to all the military medical personnel out there. There's thousands and thousands of you in the medical field inside the military. Doctors, nurses, corpsmen, medics, PAs, ATs. Thanks to all of you for your incredible dedication to keeping us alive and keeping us healthy. We thank you. And also thanks to our police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, all first responders out there. Thank you for your dedication, keeping us safe and keeping us alive here at home. And to everyone else out there, you got one body. Get one body. You don't get a spare. And that body requires discipline to maintain. And it doesn't get easier, by the way. It's it's one of those things, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I hate to break the news to you. It doesn't get easier to maintain as time goes on. There's some things in life, oh, you you start playing guitar, it gets easier. The more you practice, the easier it gets. You start doing jujitsu, jujitsu gets easier the more you do it. Maintaining your physical health gets harder over time. Now look, it might get easier from you know age 14 to age, what, 45, something like that? <laughs> yeah, if you're lucky. Yeah, then it starts going, 
it, the resistance becomes harder. It doesn't get easier. It gets harder. But let me tell you what's even worse is if you let that slide. You let that slide and your physical fitness slide, life is going to get harder. Don't let that happen. And listen, there's no shortcuts. You have to put in the work. You have to put in the work. So put in the work. Take care of yourself. Your body isn't a rental car. In the military, we had a little saying, what's the fastest car in reverse? It's a rental car and an E3 driving it. It's the fastest car in the world in reverse. Well, listen, your body is not a rental car. You've got one, and it's the only one you're ever going to have. So please take care of it. And you do that by going out there every day and getting after it. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko out.